Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. English Men of Science, Chapter 1 Antecedents Object of Book, Definition of Man of Science, Data, Nature and Nurture, Race and Birthplace, Occupation of Parents and Position in Life, Physical Peculiarities of Parents, Primogenitor, Fertility, Heredity, Pedigrees, Statistical Results. The intent of this book is to supply what may be termed a natural history of the English men of science of the present day. It will describe their earliest antecedents, including their hereditary influences, the inborn qualities of their mind and body, the causes that first induced them to pursue science, the education they received, and their opinions on its merits. The advantages are great of confining the investigation to men of our own period and nation. Our knowledge of them is more complete, and where deficient it may be supplemented by further inquiry. They are subject to a moderate range of these influences which have the largest disturbing power, and are therefore well fitted for statistical investigation. Lastly, the results we may obtain are of direct practical interest. The inquiry is a complicated one at the best. It is advantageous not to complicate it further by dealing with notabilities whose histories are seldom autobiographical, never complete, and not always very accurate, and who lived under the varied and imperfectly appreciated conditions of European life in several countries and numerous periods during many different centuries. Definition of Man of Science I do not attempt to define a scientific man, because no frontier line or definition exists which separates any group of individuals from the rest of the species. Natural groups have nuclei but no outlines. They blend on every side with other systems whose nuclei have alien characters. A naturalist must construct his picture of nature on the same principle that an engraver in mesotint proceeds on his plate, beginning with the principal lights as so many different points of departure and working outwards from each of them until the intervening spaces are covered. Some definition of an ideal scientific man might possibly be given and accepted, but who is to decide in each case whether particular individuals fall within the definition? It seems to me the best way to take the verdict of the scientific world as expressed in definite language. It may be over lenient in some cases, in others it may never have been uttered, but on the whole it appears more satisfactory than any other verdict which exists or is attainable. To have been elected a fellow of the Royal Society since the reform in the mode of election introduced by Mr. Justice Grove nearly thirty years ago is a real essay of scientific merit. Owing to various reasons, many excellent men of science of mature ages may not be fellows, but those who bear the title cannot be considered in some degree as entitled to the epithet of scientific. I therefore look upon this fellowship as a past examination, so to speak and from among the fellows of the Royal Society are select those who have yet further qualifications. One of these is a fact of having earned a medal for scientific work. Another, of having presided over a learned society or a section of the British Association. Another, of having been elected on the Council of the Royal Society. Another, of being professor at some important college or university. These and a few other similar signs of being appreciated by contemporary men of science are the qualifications for which I have looked in selecting my list of typical scientific men. I have only deviated from the technical rules in two or three cases where there appeared good reason for their relaxation and where the returns appeared likely to be of peculiar interest. On these principles I drew up a list of 180 men, most of them were qualified on more than one count and many on several counts. Also, the list appeared nearly exhaustive in respect to those men of mature age who lived in or near London, since other private tests suggested few additions. As two of these tests have been proposed by several correspondents, so it may be well to describe them. The one is the election of individuals on account of their scientific eminence. To a certain well-known literary and scientific club, the name of which it is unnecessary to mention. 
The committee of this club have the power of electing annually, out of their regular turn, nine persons eminent for science, literature, art, or public services. The two or three men who have in each year received this coveted privilege on the grounds of science now amount to a considerable number, and they are all on my list. Again, there are certain dining clubs in connection with the Royal Society. The one meeting on the afternoon of every evening that it meets, and the other more rarely, and there are about fifty members to each of these clubs, the same persons being in many instances members of both. The election to either of the clubs is a testimony of some value to the estimation of the scientific status of a man by his contemporaries. Almost all their members are on my list. No doubt many persons of considerable position living in Edinburgh, Dublin, and elsewhere at a distance from London are not among those with whose experiences I am about to deal. But that is no objection. I do not profess or care to be exhaustive in my data, only desiring to have a sufficiency of material and to be satisfied that it is good so far as it goes, and a perfectly fair sample. I do not particularly want a list that shall include every man of science in England, but seek for one that is sufficiently extended for my purposes, and that contains none but truly scientific men, in the usual acceptation of that word. However, I have made some further estimates and conclude that an exhaustive list of men of the British Isles of the same mature ages and general scientific status of those of whom I have been speaking would amount to 300, but not to more. Some of my readers may feel surprised that so many as 300 persons are to be found in the United Kingdom who deserve the title of scientific men. Probably they have been accustomed to concentrate their attention upon few notabilities and to ignore their colleagues. It must, however, be recollected that all biographies, even of the greatest men, reveal numerous associates and competitors whose merit and influence were far greater than had been suspected by the outside world. Great discoveries have often been made simultaneously by workers ignorant of each other's labours. This shows that they had derived their inspiration from a common but hidden source, as no mere chance would account for simultaneous discovery. In illustration of this view, it will suffice to mention a few of the great discoveries of this generation. That of photography is most intimately associated with the name of Nippy, Daguerre, and Talbot, who were successful in 1839 along different lines of research. But Thomas Wedgwood was a photographer in 1802, though he could not fix his pictures. As to the origin of species, Wallace is well known to have had an independent share in its discovery, side by side with the far more comprehensive investigations of Darwin. In spectrum analysis, the remarks of Stokes were interior to and independent of the works of Kirchhoff and Bunsen. Electric telegraphy has numerous parents, German, English and American. The idea of conservation of energy has unnumbered roots. The simultaneous discovery of the planet Neptune on theoretical grounds by Leverrier and Adams is a very curious instance of what we are considering. In patent inventions, the fact of simultaneous discovery is notoriously frequent. It would therefore appear that few discoveries are wholly due to a single man, but rather that vague and imperfect ideas which float in conversation and literature must grow, gather and develop, until some more perspicacious and prompt mind than the rest clearly sees them. Thus, Laplace is understood to have seized on Kant's nebular hypothesis and Bentham on Priestley's phrase, the greatest happiness of the greatest number, and each of them elaborated the idea he had so seized into a system. The first discoverers beat their contemporaries in point of time, and by doing so they become leaders of thought. They direct the intellectual energy of the day into the channels they opened. It would have run in, in other channels but for their labour. It is therefore due to them, not that science progresses, but that a progress is as rapid as it is, and in the direction towards which they themselves have striven. We must neither underrate nor overrate their achievements. I would compare the small band of men who had achieved a conspicuous scientific position to islands which are not the detached objects they appear to the vulgar eye, but only the uppermost portions of hills, whose bulk is unseen. To pursue this metaphor, the range of my inquiry dips a few fathoms below the level at which popular reputation begins. It is of interest to know the ratio which the numbers of the leading scientific men bear to the population of England generally. I obtain it in this way. 
although 180 persons only were on my list. I reckon, as already mentioned, that it would have been possible to have included 300 of the same ages without descending in the scale of scientific position. Also it appears that the ages of half of the number of my list lie between 50 and 65, and that about three quarters of these may be considered for census comparisons as English. I combine these numbers and compare them with that of the male population of England and Wales between the same limits of age, and find the required ratio to be about 1 in 10,000. What then are the conditions of nature, and the various circumstances and conditions of life, which I include under the general name of nurture, which have selected the one and left the remainder? The object of this book is to answer this question. Data my data are the autobiographical replies to a very long series of printed questions addressed severally to the 180 men whose names were in the list I have described, and they fill two large portfolios. I cannot sufficiently thank my correspondents for the courteousness with which they replied to my very troublesome queries, the great pains they have taken to be precise and truthful in their statements, and the confidence reposed in my discretion. Those of the answers which are selected for statistical treatment somewhat exceed 100 in number. In addition to these, I have utilised several others which were too incomplete for statistical purposes or which arrived late, but these also have been of real service to me, sometimes in corroborating and others in questioning previous provisional conclusions. I wish emphatically to add that the foremost members of the scientific world have contributed in full proportion to their numbers. It must not for a moment be supposed that mediocrity is unduly represented in my data. Natural history is an impersonal result. I am therefore able to treat my subject anonymously, with the exception of one chapter in which the pedigrees of certain families are given. Nature and Nurture The phrase nature and nurture is a convenient jingle of words, for it separates under two distinct heads the innumerable elements of which personality is composed. Nature is all that a man brings with himself into the world. Nurture is every influence from without that affects him after his birth. The distinction is clear. The one produces the infant, such as it actually is, including its latent faculties of growth of body and mind. The other affords the environment amid which the growth takes place by which natural tendencies may be strengthened or thwarted, or wholly new ones implanted. Neither of the terms implies any theory. Natural gifts may or may not be hereditary, Nurture does not especially consist of food, clothing, education, or tradition, but it includes all these and similar influences, whether known or unknown. When nature and nurture compete for supremacy on equal terms in the sense to be explained, the former proves the stronger. It is needless to insist that neither is self-sufficient. The highest natural endowments may be staffed by defective nurture, while no carefulness of nurture can overcome the evil tendencies of an intrinsically bad physique, weak brain, or brutal disposition. Differences of nurture stamp unmistakable marks on the disposition of the soldier, clergyman, or scholar, but are wholly insufficient to efface the deeper marks of individual character. The impress of class distinctions is superficial and may be compared to those which give a general resemblance to a family of daughters at a provincial ball, all dressed alike, and so similar in voice and address as to puzzle a recently introduced partner in his endeavours to recollect with which of them he is engaged to dance. But an intimate friend forgets their general resemblance in the presence of the far greater dissimilarity which he has learned to appreciate. There are twins of the same sex so alike in body and mind that not even their own mothers can distinguish them. Their features, voice and expressions are similar. They see things in the same light and their ideas follow the same laws of association. This close resemblance necessarily gives way under the gradually accumulated influences of difference of nurture, but it often lasts till manhood. I have been told of a case in which two twin brothers, both married, the one a medical man and the other a clergyman, were staying at the same house. One morning for a joke, they changed their neckties, and each impersonated the other, sitting by his wife through the whole of the breakfast without discovery. Shakespeare was a close observer of nature. It is therefore worth recollecting that he recognises in his 36 plays three pairs of family likenesses, so deceptive as to create absurd confusion. Two of these pairs are in the Comedy of Errors, and the other in Twelfth Night, Volume 1. I heard of a case not many years back in which a young Englishman had travelled to St. Petersburg, then 
much less accessible than now, with no letters of introduction, and who lost his pocket-book, and was penniless. He was walking along the quay in some despair at his prospects, when he was startled by the cheery voice of a stranger who accosted him, saying he required no introduction because his family likeness proclaimed him to be the son of an old friend. The Englishman did not conceal his difficulties, and the stranger actually lent him the sum he needed on the guarantee of his family likeness, confirmed, no doubt, by some conversation. In this and similar instances, how small has been the influence of nurture? The child had developed into manhood along a predestined course laid out in his nature. It would be impossible to find a converse instance in which two persons, unlike at their birth, had been moulded by similarity of nurture into so close a resemblance that their nearest relations failed to distinguish them. Let us quote Shakespeare again as an illustration in A Midsummer Night's Dream. 3.2. Helena and Hermia, who had been inseparable in childhood and girlhood, and had identical nurture. So we grew together, like to a double cherry seeming parted, but yet a union in partition. We're physically quite unlike. The one was short and dark, the other tall and fair. Therefore the similarity of their nurture did not affect their features. The moral likeness was superficial, because a sore trial of temper, which produced a violent quarrel between them, brought out great dissimilarity of character. In the competition between nature and nurture, when the differences in either case do not exceed those which distinguish individuals of the same race living in the same country under no very exceptional conditions, nature certainly proves the stronger of the two. Race and Birthplace As regards the race of the scientific men on my list, it has already been mentioned that for the purpose of a census enumeration, three-fourths may be considered English, but their precise origin is as follows. Omitting a few Germans, out of every ten scientific men, five are pure English, one is Anglo-Welsh, one is Anglo-Irish, one is pure Scotch, one includes Anglo-Scotch, Scotch-Irish, pure Irish, Welsh, Manx, and Channel Islands. Finally, one is unclassed. These unclassed are of extremely mixed origin. One is in about equal degrees English, Irish, French, and German. Another is English, Scotch, Creole, and Dutch another English, Dutch, Creole, and Swedish, and so on. I trust the reader knows what Creoles are, namely the descendants of white families long settled in a tropical colony, and that he does not confound the term with mulattoes. I give this information without being able to make much present use of it. It is chiefly intended to serve as a standard with which other natural groups may hereafter be compared, such as groups of artists or of literary men. One would desire to know whether persons in England generally show so great a diversity of origin, but it is somewhat difficult to answer the question owing to a want of precision in the word generally. If we were to go to rural districts or small stagnant towns, we should find much less variety of origin, but I think there would be quite as much in the more energetic classes of the metropolis who have immigrated from all quarters. Some haphazard selecting which I tried confirmed this view. Then comes the important question, is this a sign that a mixture of one or more of the various civilized races is more conductive to form an able offspring? No doubt the varied nurture, due to separate streams of tradition, has great influence in awakening original thought, but we are not speaking of this now. The question is about nature. On an analysis of the scientific status of the men on my list, it appeared to me that their ability is high in proportion to their numbers among those of pure race. The border men and lowland Scotch come out exceedingly well. The Anglo-Irish and Anglo-Welsh, notwithstanding eminent individual exceptions, would as a whole rank last. Owing to my list not being exhausted, I hardly like to attempt conclusions as to the precise productiveness of scientific ability of the Scotch, English and Irish, severally. But there cannot be a shadow of doubt that its degrees are in the order I have named. The birthplace of scientific men and of their parents are usually in towns away from the sea coast. Out of every five birthplaces, I found that one lies in London or its suburbs, one in an important town such as Edinburgh, Glasgow, Dublin, Birmingham, Liverpool or Manchester. One is in a small town, and two either in a village or actually in the country. These returns are given with more detail in the footnote. The branch of science pursued is often in curious disaccord with the surrounding influence of the birthplace. 
Mechanicans are usually hardy lads born in the country. Biologists are frequently pure townsfolk. Partially in consequence of the prevalence of their urban distribution, I find that an irregular plot may be marked on the map of England, which includes much less than one half of its area, but more than 92% of the birthplaces of the English scientific men or of their parents. The accompanying diagram shows its position. One thin arm abuts on the sea between Hastings and Folkestone, and runs northwards over London and Birmingham, where it is joined by another thin arm preceding from Cornwall and Devonshire crossing the Bristol Channel to Swansea, and thence to Worcester. The two arms are now combined into one of double breadth. It covers Nottingham, Shrewsbury, Liverpool, and Manchester. Above these latitudes, it again narrows, and after sending a small branch to Hull, proceeds northwards to Newcastle, Edinburgh, and Glasgow. Thus, there are large areas in England and Wales outside this irregular plot which are very deficient in Aboriginal science. One comprises the whole of the eastern counties. Another includes the huge triangle at whose angles Hastings, Worcester, and Exeter, or rather Exmouth, are situated. Occupation of parents and position in life. My list contains men who have been born in every social grade, from the highest order in the peerage down to the factory hand and simple peasant, but the returns which I shall discuss do not range quite so widely. These are ninety-six in number and may be classified as follows. But the same name appears in two classes on 11 occasions, so that the total entries are raised to 107. Noblemen and private gentlemen, 9. Army and Navy, 6. Civil Service, 9. Subordinate Officers, 3. Total, 18. Law, 11. Medical, 9. Clergy Ministers, 6. Teachers, 6. Architect, 1. Secretary to an Insurance Office, 1. Total, 34. Bankers, 7. Merchants, 21. Manufacturers, 15. Total, 43. Farmers, 2. Others, 1. Total of 107. The terms used in the third and fourth groups must be understood in a very general sense. Thus, there are some merchants on a very small scale indeed, and others on a very large one. It is by no means the case that those who have raised themselves by their abilities are found to be abler than their contemporaries who began their careers with advantages of fortune and social position. They are not more distinguished as original investigators, neither are they more discerning in those numerous questions, not strictly scientific, which happen to be brought before the councils of scientific societies. There can be no doubt but that the upper classes of a nation like our own, which are largely and continually recruited by selections from below, are by far the most productive of natural ability. The lower classes are, in truth, the residuum. Of the six clergymen or ministers who were fathers of scientific men, no less than four appear in a second category, viz. 1. Clergyman and schoolmaster. 2. Physician, afterwards clergyman. 3. Unitarian minister and schoolmaster. 4. Professor of Classics, afterwards an independent minister. Among the successful graduates of Oxford and Cambridge, and among purely literary men, we find a much larger proportion of sons of clergymen. There is at Cambridge a well-known university scholarship, called The Bell, which is open only to sons of clergymen of the Church of England. As it has been chiefly given for classical proficiency, we may be almost sure that the senior classic of his year, if he were the son of a clergyman, would also be a Bell scholar. I looked through the lists and found that out of 45 senior classics, 1824 to 68 inclusive, 10 had gained the scholarship. Whence I conclude that at least one out of every four or five Cambridge graduates is the son of a clergyman. At this rate, out of 100 Cambridge graduates, 22 would have had clergymen of the Church of England for their fathers. Whereas, out of 100 scientific men, only three or four were so circumstanced. It is therefore a fact that in proportion to the pains bestowed on their education generally, the sons of clergymen rarely take a lead in science. The pursuit of science is uncongenial to the priestly character. It has fallen to my lot to serve for many years on the councils of many scientific societies, and excepting a very few astronomers and mathematicians, about whom I will speak directly, I can only recall three colleagues who were clergymen. Curiously enough, two of these, the Revs, 
Baden Powell and Dunbar Heath have been prosecuted for unorthodoxy. The third was Bishop Wilberforce, who can hardly be said to have loved science. He rarely attended the meetings, but delighted in administration and sought openings for indirect influence. The reason for the abstinence of clergymen from scientific work cannot be that they are too busy, too much home tied, or cramped in pecuniary means, because other professional men, more busy, more at the call of others, and having less assured revenues, are abundantly presented on all the council lists. Not caring to trust my unaided recollections, I have examined the council lists of ten scientific societies at or near the three periods, 1850, 1860, 1870. There have been changes in some of the societies, and there are many trifling peculiarities of detail, tedious and unnecessary here to deal with, but the following statement is substantially correct. The ordinary members of council are on a rough general average twenty in number to each of the following societies. 1. Royal. 2. British Association. 3. Astronomical. 4. Chemical. 5. Geological. 6. Linnean. 7. Zoological. 8. Geographical. 9 and 10. The two predecessors of the recently established Anthropological Institute. Viz. Ethnological and Anthropological. 11. Statistical. Therefore, as we are dealing with three distinct periods, eleven societies and twenty members of council to each, there have been about three multiplied by eleven multiplied by twenty equals six hundred and sixty separate appointments. Clergymen have held only sixteen of these, or one in forty, and they have in nearly every case been attached to those subdivisions of science which have fewer salient points to scratch or jar against dogma. Thus Professor Chalice, Dr. Lloyd, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Wewell. Rev. J. Fisher, Rev. W. Webb, Rev. Vernon Harcourt, Prof. Pritchard, Prof. Price, Rev. J. Barlow, and Prof. Willis are all chiefly connected with astronomy, physics, and mathematics. The five remaining names are those of the Rev. G. C. Renard, the geographer, Bishop Wilberforce, and the Rev. Dunbar Heath, of whom I have already spoken the Rev. Dr. Nicholson and the Rev. Canon Greenwell. There is not a single biologist among them. Physical Peculiarities of Parents It has been frequently asserted that certain physical peculiarities in the parents clash and that others combine happily in the offspring. I therefore thought it well to make inquiries as to the figure, complexion, colour of hair, height and other physical peculiarities of the fathers and mothers of the scientific men. I also asked about the temperaments, if they were marked, but the answers to these were few. Tables showing the number of cases in which there has been harmony, indifference or contrast between various physical peculiarities of the two parents. Our tables displayed on the page, the temperament of parents. Summary, harmony, 10 cases, contrast, 2, indifferent, 10, total, 22. Tables displayed on page, colour of hair of parents. Summary, harmony, 44 cases, contrast 6, indifferent, 22, total, 72. I have in addition 11 cases of coloured hair, yellowish, sandy, red, light auburn, dark auburn, chestnut, but not one case of strict harmony among them. A table is displayed on the page, figure of parents of scientific men. Summary, harmony, 24 cases, contrast 23, indifferent 24, total 71. The foregoing tables show results bearing on the question whether harmony or contrast prevails in the physical characteristics of the parents. I think they must be accepted as decidedly in favour of harmony. The grand totals which they give are 78 cases of harmony, 31 of contrast and 56 of indifference. In short, there is more purity of breed in scientific men than would have resulted from haphazard marriages. In the temperaments of their parents, harmony strongly prevails over contrast, the proportion being five to one in favour of the former. Colour of hair, harmony is twice as frequent as contrast. In figure, it is equally common because corpulent, stout or plump persons of one sex seem to have a peculiar and reciprocated liking for spare, neat or small persons of the other. This is literally the only case in these tables where a love of contrast equals that of harmony. 
I came to much the same conclusions by giving appropriate marks for harmony, contrast, and indifference to each quality in each case, thus obtaining aggregate marks for every pair, which I treated on much the same principle that their separate qualities are treated in the table. As regards height, there is a stricter method of investigation, which statisticians will appreciate. It is well known by repeated experience that the heights of men and of women in any large group are distributed according to the law of frequency of error. In other words, the proportionate numbers of people of different heights corresponds to what would have been the case supposing stature to be due to the aggregate action of many small and independent variable causes. The probability is inconceivably small that all the independent causes should in any given case cooperate to produce an excess of height. If they did so, the result will be a Brobdicknagian giant, or that they should all cooperate to produce a deficiency in height, in which case the result would be a Lilliputian dwarf. On the other hand, the probability is great that the number and effects of the causes in excess and those in deficiency of their several average values will be pretty equal. As for these and all other intermediate cases, their relative frequency is determined by the above law, which is based on that by which the relative frequency of different runs of luck is calculated. I now proceed to apply this law. I have 62 cases in which the heights of both parents are given numerically, whence it appears that 1. The average height of the fathers is between 5 foot 9 inches and 5 foot 9 and a quarter inches, and that that distribution conforms closely to the law of frequency of error, the probable error of the series being 1.7 inches. 2. The average height of the mothers is 5 foot 4.5 inches, and the distribution of their heights conforms fairly to the above-mentioned law, the probable error of the series being 1.9 inches. It follows from the well-known properties of the law in question that if there had been no sexual selection in respect of height, the sum of the heights of the two parents would also conform to the law of frequency of error. It appears from the facts in this chapter that the marriages of parents of the scientific men on my list actually tended to produce differentiation and purity of race. My data concerning the parents of men of other groups are insufficient to enable me yet to give comparative results showing how far the selective sexual interests of the population generally would thwart, be indifferent to, or cooperate with the influences of future social restrictions on unsuitable marriages or encouragement of suitable ones. Primogenitor, etc. The following statements shows, in percentages, the position of the scientific men in respect to age among their brothers and sisters. Only sons, 22 cases. Eldest sons, 26 cases. Youngest sons, 15 cases. Of those who are neither eldest nor youngest, 13 come in the elder half of the family, 12 in the younger half, and 11 are exactly in the middle. Total, 99. It further appears that, at the time of the birth of the scientific men, the ages of their fathers averaged 36 years, and those of their mothers 30. The details are shown in the table below. The table is displayed on the page, Age of Parents at Birth of Scientific Men. There are two columns going across, with the number of cases, and the fathers and mothers. Under 20, fathers 0, mothers 2. 20, Onwards, fathers 1, mothers 20. 25 onwards, fathers 15, mothers 26. 30 onwards, fathers 34, mothers 34. 35 onwards, fathers 22, mothers 12. 40 onwards, fathers 17, mothers 5. 45 onwards, fathers 7, mothers 1. 50 and above, fathers 4, mothers no data. 100 total cases. Putting these facts together, viz. 1. That elder sons appear nearly twice as often as younger sons. 2. That as regards intermediate children, the elder and younger halves of the family contribute equally. And 3. That only sons are as common as elder sons. We must conclude that the age of the parents, within the limits with which we chiefly have to deal, has little influence on the nature of the child. Secondly, that the elder sons have on the whole decided advantages of nurture over the younger sons. They are more likely to become possessed of independent means, and therefore able to follow the pursuits that have most attraction to their tastes. 
They are treated more as companions by their parents and have earlier responsibility, both of which would develop independence of character. Probably also, the first-born child of families in the world would generally have more attention in his infancy, more breathing space, and better nourishment than his younger brothers and sisters in their several turns. The opposing disadvantage of primogeniture in producing less healthy children and half as many idiots again as the average of the rest of the family has not been sensibly felt, partly because the latter risk is very small, and partly because the mothers of the scientific men are somewhat less youthful than those from whom the above statistical results were calculated. C. Duncan, On Fertility, etc., 2nd edition, page 293, 4, for tabulations of Dr. A. Mitchell's results. An unusual number of the mothers of the scientific men were between 30 and 34 at the time of their birth. This is a very suitable age, according to the views of Aristotle, but undoubtedly older than what Dr. Duncan's statistics, page 387-390, recommend. According to these, the most favourable period for the survival of mother and child, and therefore probably the best in every sense, is when she is 20 to 25, at the time of giving birth. The important question of the effect of the age of the parent on the well-being of the offspring seems never yet to have been treated as strictly and as copiously as it deserves. Dr. Duncan, in the chapter of his work above referred to, has discussed the materials at his disposal with great ingenuity and industry, but adequate statistics sorted according to the various classes of society are still wanting. Fertility The families are usually large to which scientific men belong. I have two sets of returns the one of brothers and sisters, excluding for the most part those who died in infancy, and the other of brothers and sisters who attained thirty years. In these several cases I have included the scientific man himself, and find, on an average of about one hundred cases, that the total number of brothers and sisters is 6.3 in the first case and 4.8 in the second. It is a matter of great interest to compare with these figures the number of the children of the scientific men themselves. It is easy to do so with fairness because the time of marriage proves to be nearly the same in both cases. If anything, the scientific men marry earlier than their parents. It remains to eliminate all cases of absolutely sterile marriages on the part of the scientific men and those in which there might yet be other children born. Having attended to these precautions, I find the number of their living children, say of ages between 5 and 30, to be 4.7. This implies a diminution of fertility as compared with that of their own parents, and it confirms a common belief in the tendency to an extinction of the families of men who work hard with the brain. On the other hand, I shall show that the health and energy of the scientific men are remarkably high. It therefore seems strange that there should be a falling off in their offspring. I have tried in many ways to find characteristics common to those scientific men whose families were the smallest, but have only lighted upon one general result, which I give provisionally, namely, that the relative deficiency of health and energy in respect to that of their own parents is very common among them. Their absolute health and energy may be high, far exceeding those of people generally, but I speak of a noticeable falling off from the yet more robust condition of the previous generation. It is this which appears to be dangerous to the continuance of the race. My figures give the remarkable result that there are no children at all in one out of every three of these cases. I think that ordinary observation corroborates this conclusion, and that those of my readers who happen to have mixed much in what is called intellectual society will be able to recall numerous instances of persons of both sexes, but especially of women, possessed of high gifts of every kind, including health and energy, but of less solid vigour than their parents, and who have no children. I do not overlook the fact that the scientific men are an urban population, being mindful of results I have published elsewhere, Statistical Journal, 1873, which show a similar diminution in the average fertility of townsmen as compared with country folk. But this would not account for their being less prolific than their parents, who were also townsmen, nor for the large number of wholly sterile marriages. Heredity The effects of education and circumstances are so interwoven with those of natural character in determining a man's position among his contemporaries that I find it impossible to treat them wholly apart. 
Still less is it possible completely to separate the evidences relating to that portion of a man's nature which is due to heredity from all the rest. Heredity and many other cooperating causes must therefore be considered in connection, but I feel sure that as the reader proceeds and becomes familiar with the variety of the evidence, he will insensibly effect for himself much of the required separation. Also, from time to time, as opportunity may offer, I shall attempt to draw distinctions. The study of hereditary form and features in combination with character promises to be of much interest, but it proves disappointing on trial, owing to the impossibility of obtaining good historical portraits. The value of these is further diminished by the passion of distinguished individuals to be portrayed in uniforms, wigs, robes, or whatever voluminous drapery seems most appropriate to their high office, forgetting that all this conceals the man. The practice might well be common of photographing the features from different points of view and at different periods of life in such a way as would be most advantageous to a careful study of the lineaments of the man and his family. The interest that would attach to collections of these in after times might be extremely great. End of chapter 1, part 1 of English Men of Science by Francis Galton Chapter 1, part 2 of English Men of Science by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Leon Harvey. Chapter 1, Part 2 Pedigrees Thirteen families have been selected. Out of those to which about 120 of the scientific men on my list belong, as appearing noteworthy for their richness in ability during two, three, or more generations, or for any other peculiarity. In some cases, they are also remarkable for purity of type. In some cases, they are also remarkable for purity of type. The facts may, for the most part, be verified by reference to the publications of which the titles are given, and the whole could have been obtained by any one who cared to search other more or less public sources of information. Five of these families, Bentham, Darwin, Dawson, Turner, Roscoe and Taylor of Ungar have already been alluded to in my previous work, Hereditary Genius, whence I have extracted what appeared to the point adding what was necessary. In estimating the number of individuals in each generation, the practice has been usually adopted of not counting those who died young or have not yet attained their thirtieth year. Alderson. Many members of this family have been intellectually gifted, there have been an unusual number of cases of mathematical achievement among them. First generation, five males and two females, children of Reverend J. Alderson and his wife, the latter lived to 94. Of these, three males deserve notice. 1. James Alderson, M.D. of Norwich. 2. Robert Alderson, Recorder of Norwich, Ipswich and Yarmouth. 3. John Alderson, founder and president of all the literary and scientific institutions of the time in Kingston upon Hull. All these were men of considerable local repute. Second generation, 15 males and 12 females, of whom 5 males and 1 female deserve a special mention. 1. Sir Edward Hall Alderson, Baron of the Excelsior, and who the first man of his year at Cambridge, both in mathematics and classics, being senior wrangler and senior classical medalist. A distinction barely equaled in the long annals of university achievement. 2. Robert Woodhouse, also a senior wrangler, Lucasian and Plumian Professor of Astronomy at Cambridge. 3. The Reverend Samuel H. Alderson, third wrangler and tutor of Chaos College. 4. Sir James Alderson, M.D. F.R.S., 6th Wrangler, for four years President of the Royal College of Physicians. 5. Colonel Ralph Alderson, R.E., a distinguished officer, and one of the first Government Commissioners of Railways. 1. Mrs. Amelia Opie, the novelist, third generation. I have not sufficient information, although I know that it includes many persons of ability, among whom is Major H. Alderson, R.A., a distinguished officer, also a married lady of high artistic powers. Bentham A family consisting of only three male representatives, all eminent and one illustrious. First generation, two brothers, one, Jeremy Bentham, 
Jurist of the Highest Rank, Life by Sir J. Bowring, prefixed to the collected works edited by him. 2. General Sir Samuel Bentham, whose early manhood was spent in the Russian service, distinguished for his numerous administrative reforms and singular inventive power. Afterwards Inspector General of Naval Works in England, Life by his Widow, 1862. Second generation, one male only, George Bentham, F.R.S., systematic botanist of the highest rank, in early life writer on logic, for many years president of the Linnaean Society. Carpenter. Among the characteristics of this family are literary and scientific enterprise, philanthropic effort, nonconformity, and aptitude for oral exposition. First generation. Reverend Lant Carpenter, LLD, Unitarian minister, descended from a non-subscribing Presbyterian family and married to a wife of similar descent, a leading member of the Liberal Party in Exeter and Bristol, extremely active in the promotion of philanthropic objects, both literary and scientific in his studies, and a man of local celebrity. Memoirs by his son, 1842. Second generation, two males and three females, of whom both the males and one female require notice. One, William B. Carpenter, FRS, Registrar of the London University, Physiologist, and frequent writer and speaker on scientific subjects, in many cases connected with social amelioration. 2. Dr. B. P. Carpenter of Montreal, Conchologist, actively engaged in philanthropic work. 1. Mary Carpenter, actively engaged in the foundation and organization of philanthropic institutions, especially juvenile reformatories and promoter of female education in India. Third generation, too young for special notice, includes an influential dissenting minister and a very successful student. Darwin. There are many instances in this family of a love for natural history and theory, and of an aptitude for collecting facts in business-like but peculiar ways. Speaking from private sources of knowledge, I am sure that these characteristics are hereditary rather than traditional. There is also a strong element of individuality in the race which is adverse to traditional influence. First Generation 1. Erasmus Darwin, M.D. F.R.S., Physician, Physiologist and Poet. His botanic garden had an immense reputation at the time it was written, for besides its intrinsic merits, it chimed in with the sentiments and mode of expression of his day. The ingenuity of Dr. Darwin's numerous writings and theories is truly remarkable. He was held in very high esteem by his scientific friends, including such celebrities as Priestley and James Watt and it is by a man's position among his contemporaries and competitors that his worth may most justly be appraised. Unfortunately for his memory, he has had no good biographer. He was a man of great vigour, humour and geniality. Miss Seward's life of him, and latterly a pamphlet by Dr. Richardson, see also Mettiard's Life of Wedgwood. 2. His brother, Robert Waring Darwin, wrote Principa Botanica, which reached its third edition in 1810. It is said in Mettiard's Life of Wedgwood that the Darwins sprang from a lettered and intellectual race, as his, Dr. Darwin's, father was one among the earliest members of the Spalding Club. Second generation. Seven males, three females, of whom three males deserve notice. 1. Charles Darwin, who died at the age of only 21, poisoned by a dissection wound, but who had already achieved such distinction that his name has been frequently mentioned in biographical dictionaries. His thesis on obtaining the gold medal of the Edinburgh University was on the distinction between pus and mucus. It was a real step forward in those early days of exact medical science, and was thought highly of at the time. 2. Robert Waring Darwin, M.D. F.R.S., a physician and shrewd observer of great provincial celebrity, on many grounds who lived at Shrewsbury. He married a daughter of Wedgwood's and was father of Charles Darwin, see below. 3. Sir Francis Darwin, originally a physician, but for many years living in a then secluded part of Derbyshire, surrounded by animal oddities. Half wild pigs ran about the woods, tamed snakes frequented the house and the like. Third generation. Eight males, fourteen females, of whom three males may be mentioned, but illustriously among them, one. Charles Darwin, FRS, the Aristotle of our days, whom all scientific men reverence and love. The simple grandeur of those conclusions is as remarkable as the magnitude and 
multifariousness of their foundation. There is much ability in many individuals in this generation who bear the name of Darwin, and it has been strongly directed to natural history in the case of, too, a son of Sir Francis Darwin, a frequent writer, under a well-known nom de plume on sporting matters. Among those who do not bear that name, being children of the daughters of Sir Erasmus Darwin, I mention three, myself, with all humility, as falling technically within the limits of the group of scientific men under discussion, on the ground of former geographical work and having had much to do in the administration of various scientific societies. Fourth generation includes very few individuals who have reached mature manhood. Among these are one George Darwin, second Wrangler at Cambridge, author of an important article on restrictions to liberty of marriage. Two, Captain Leonard Darwin R.A., who was second in the competition of his year for Woolwich and now engaged on the transit of Venus expedition. 3. Henry Parker, fellow of University College, Oxford, classical scholar and chemist. Dawson Turner. This family is characterised by great intellectual activity and much artistic taste. First generation. Dawson Turner, F.R.S., botanist, scholar, and a man of unwearied activity in collecting and compiling, and an encourager of work and others. One of his two uncles was a Reverend Joseph Turner, senior wrangler in 1768, and much distinguished by the personal friendship of Mr. Pitt. Among his ten male first cousins on the paternal side were the late Lord Justice Turner and his accomplished brothers. Second generation, two males and six females. The latter were all remarkable for their energy, accomplishments, and the large share they took in the literary labour of their father and husbands, which was not confined to transcribing. Three were accomplished artists, one a musician, another well-versed in Greek. Third generation. Of those above the age of thirty, there are five males, three females, of whom four males deserve mention. One, Dr. Joseph Hooker, President of the Royal Society, very eminent botanist, director of Kew Gardens, and formerly Tibetan traveller and naturalist to an Antarctic expedition. His father was Sir William Hooker, FRS, also one of the first botanists of his day, and director of Kew Gardens. 2. Francis Palgrave, editor of the Golden Treasury, scholar and art critic. 3. Gifford Palgrave, orientalist, Arabian explorer and author of one of the most remarkable works of travel ever written. 4. R. H. Inglis Palgrave, statistician. The father of the three last was Sir Francis Palgrave, historian. Harcourt, scholastic success, with much love for science. First generation. The Reverend Vernon Harcourt, Archbishop of York, a man of polished intellect and social gifts. Second generation. Ten males and three females, of whom four males deserve notice. One, the Reverend W. Vernon Harcourt, FRS, chemist, the first president of and one of the founders of the British Association at a time when science was partially ridiculed and partially denounced. He was the chief framer of its elaborate constitution, which is, I believe, a solitary instance of the invention of a complex administrative machinery which worked perfectly from the first and has continued working almost unchanged for nearly half a century. It has served as a model upon which many other societies have organised themselves. 2. Egerton and 3. Edward Vernon Harcourt, both double firsts at Oxford, and four, Granville Vernon Harcourt, who died when an undergraduate at Oxford, having gained the Latin University Prize. Third generation, ten males and thirteen females, of whom two males deserve mention. One, Sir William Vernon Harcourt, MP, lately Solicitor General, Professor of International Law at Cambridge, well known as a political writer under the name Historicus. 2. Augustus G. Vernon Harcourt, FRS, a distinguished chemist, Lee's Reader in Chemistry at Oxford. Hill. The characteristics of this family are active interest in social improvement, power of organisation, mechanical aptitude, and general sterling worth. Its type in the second generation seems to have been unusually pure. First generation, Thomas Wright Hill. Descendant from stanch independence, and married to a wife of equal vigour and fortitude, who came from a family noted for mechanical aptitude, which she transmitted to her descendants. He rose by his own exertions, and, estimating forty, established a school, much spoken of at the time, 
on an entirely new principle of management at Hazelwood, near Birmingham. The boys were taken into administrative cooperation. They regulated their own discipline, and the things they learnt were of the most varied kind. Some men of high note were educated there, and among these at least one of the scientific men on my list. He gave much attention to mental calculation, and even on his deathbed, estimating 88, invented and successfully applied a new method for determining, for any year, the date of Easter. Also known for his analysis of articulate sounds and phonography. Short biographical notice in annual report, R. Astronomical Society, February 13, 1852. Second generation consisted of five males and two females. All five males had strong points of resemblance and deserved notice. 1. Sir Rowland Hill, KCB and FRS originator and organiser of the system of penny postage, which is an influence of the first order of magnitude in modern civilization. He was noted in youth for powers of mental calculation, and in some points was superior even to Zara Colburn and George Bitter. Thus, he could mentally extract to the nearest integer the cube root of any number not exceeding 2,000 millions. First inventor, 1835, of rotary printing, the method which, with slight changes of detail, is still in use for newspapers. Rewarded by three separate grants, viz. in 1846 by a public testimonial of the value of £13,360, in 1864 by the award from the Treasury of his full salary of two thousand pounds a year on his retirement and in the same year by a parliamentary grant of twenty thousand pounds two matthew davenport hill q c late recorder of birmingham law reformer of note especially in reference to dealings with the criminal class substituting promptitude certainty and strictness for delay uncertainty and severity c law magazine july eighteen seventy two three edwin hill superintendent of the stamp department first inventor of the envelope folding machine since improved by mr d la rue he completely remodelled the stamping machinery at somerset house was most highly commended for these improvements in each of the first three reports of the commissioners of inland revenue and again by a minute on his retirement referring to his eminent and exceptional service he like his brother was a standard writer on dealings with criminals also on currency for Arthur, headmaster of Bruce Castle School, where he fully developed the principles first laid down by his father. 5. Frederick Hill, formerly inspector of prisons, then assistant secretary of the post office, a great and thorough reformer of the prisons under his observation, aiming to fit prisoners for honest life on their release. Concurrently, he contributed numerous memoirs on social improvements generally. Third generation. 14 males and 17 females, among many of whom the family characteristics continue well marked. Thus, one Dr. Berkeley Hill and two Miss Emily Clark of Adelaide, Australia, are both actively engaged in work connected with pauper children. Latrobe, a family characterised by its religious bent and musical and literary tastes, joined to a love of enterprise. First Generation, Benjamin Latrobe, a convert to the Moravians, of which esteemable sect he was a patriarch and a mainstay. Aiken's History of Manchester. Second generation. Three males, zero females. Two at least of whom deserves notice. 1. Christian Ignatius Latrobe, author of the well-known collection of sacred music. 2. Benjamin Latrobe, architect and engineer in America. Third generation, seven males, two females, of whom two deserve especial notice. 1. Charles Joseph Latrobe, Governor of Victoria at the time of the gold discoveries, author of a once extremely popular book on Switzerland called The Alpenstock, which was the precursor of Murray's handbooks and more generally diffused knowledge. Many others of this generation who bear the Latrobe name are gifted with the family characteristics. 2. John Frederick Bateman, FRS, Distinguished Engineer. Fourth generation, still young, includes Colonel Osman Latrobe, who was Chief of General Lee's staff in America at an early age. Playfair. Among the characteristics of this family is an interest in various branches of science joined to a capacity for official work and public action. First generation, Reverend Dr. Playfair, Principal of the University of St. Andrews, author of a work on geography. Second generation, four males and three females, of whom three males deserve notice. 1. 
George Playfair, M.D., Chief Inspector General of Hospitals in Bengal. He was the head of his profession in India and author of various medical memoirs. 2. Colonel Sir Hugh Lyon Playfair, who, on his retirement from service, pursued life of incessant activity in public improvement. Numerous biographical notices were written of him soon after his death. 3. Colonel William Playfair, whose memory still lives in India as one of the most accomplished amateur actors. There were two cousins in this generation, the one a very distinguished man, Professor Playfair, the celebrated mathematician and author of the Huttonian theory. The other was Mr. Playfair, an architect of much eminence, to whom many of the principal public buildings in Edinburgh are due. Third generation, 21 males and 20 females, of whom two males deserve a special notice. 1. The Right Honorary Lyon Playfair, M.P., F.R.S., formerly Professor of Chemistry, long engaged in scientific administration of various kinds, and Postmaster General at the close of the late administration. 2. Colonel R. L. Playfair, R.A., the well-known Consul General of Algiers and Naturalist. A third brother is a professor at King's College. Roscoe. The type of this family is strongly marked. It has been characterised by much cultivation, refinement, and poetical taste. First generation, William Roscoe, author of Lorenzo de Medici, Leo X, etc. The above-mentioned characteristics were strongly marked in him. Life by his son, memoirs by Hartley Coleridge in Northern Worthies, and sketches by Washington Irving. Second generation, seven males and three females of whom four males and two females deserve notice. 1. Thomas Roscoe, editor of Lanzi's History of Painting, and author of many other works. 2. Henry Roscoe, author of a standard book on the law of evidence of British lawyers and of the life of his father. 3 and 4. Both decidedly gifted and authors of poems of merit. 1. Jane Elizabeth Roscoe, a woman of superior mind, intensely interested in public affairs, writer of some poems. 2. Mary Ann Roscoe, authoress of poems of merit. 3rd generation, 17 males, 16 females, of whom 3 males and 1 female deserve notice. 1. William Cadwell Roscoe, poet and critic, memoirs and collected works by R. H. Hutton. 2. Henry Unfield Roscoe, F.R.S., professor, eminent chemist. 3. William Stanley Jevons, F.R.S., Professor, author of The Coal Question, and of various works on logic and political economy. 1. Margaret Roscoe, afterwards Mrs. Sandback, novelist. Stretchy. An old family, small in numbers, but of a marked and persistent type. Among its characteristics are an active interest in public matters and an administrative aptitude. There have been men of eminence in generations previous to those mentioned below. First generation... Sir Henry Strachey, Under Secretary of State and otherwise employed in high official posts in India, America and England. Real negotiator of peace at Versailles. Stanhope's History of England. Received Medal of Society of Arts for having introduced indigo into Florida. Second generation. Three males, one female, of whom two males deserve notice. 1. Sir Henry Strachey, Indian Judge, called by James Mill in his History of India, the wisest of the company's servants. Aided much in the organization of the Indian Judicial Administration. 2. Edward Strachey, author of reports of acknowledged weight on Indian judicial subjects. 5th report. 3rd generation, 6 males and 1 female, of whom 3 males deserve notice. 1. Sir John Strachey, eminent in all branches of civil administration in India. 2. Henry Strachey, Tibetan explorer, gold medalist of the Royal Geographical Society. 3. Major General Richard Strachey, R.E., F.R.S., Active Administrator of Indian Engineering Work, Physical Geographer. Taylors of Ongar. Numerous members of this family have shown a curious combination of restless literary talent, artistic taste, evangelical disposition and mechanical aptitudes. There is an interesting work published upon it called Family Pen by the Reverend Isaac Taylor, 1867 see below in the fourth generation, which contains a list of 90 publications by 10 different members of the family up to that time, and there have been more publications, and at least one new writer since. First generation, 
Isaac Taylor came to London with an artist's ambition, ended up being a reputable engraver. He acted for many years as secretary to the Incorporated Society of Artists of Great Britain, which was the forerunner of the Royal Academy. All the family characteristics were strongly marked in him. Second generation consisted of three males, all of whom deserve notice. 1. Charles Taylor, a learned recluse, editor of Calmet's Bible. 2. Reverend Isaac Taylor, author of Scenes in Europe, etc., educated as an engraver and far surpassing his father in ability. He married Anne Martin, a woman of reputed genius, authoress of the family mansion and the numerous able members of the Taylor family for the two next generations sprung, with one exception from this fortunate union. 3. Josiah Taylor, eminent publisher of architectural works. He made a large fortune. 3rd Generation Descendants of Isaac Taylor and Anne Martin, three males and three females, of whom two males and two females deserve notice. 1. Isaac Taylor author of Natural History of Enthusiasm. 2. Jeffreys Taylor, author of Ralph Richards, Young Islanders, etc. 1 and 2. Anne and Jan Taylor, joint authors of Original Poems. Anne married the Reverend Joseph Gilbert. In this same generation is ranked the Reverend Howard Hinton, a leading Baptist minister who was a son of one of the sisters in the previous generation and is father of a well-known aurist. Fourth Generation six males and nine females now living, and some few others who are deceased. Of these, five males and one female deserve special notice. 1. Reverend Isaac Taylor, author of Words and Places of the Family Pen and of Etruscan Researches. 2. Josiah Gilbert, author of The Dolomite Mountains. 3. Joseph Gilbert, FRS, eminent for his chemical and physiological researches in their relation to agriculture. The paternal race of Gilbert had also a marked type. 4. Thomas Martin Herbert, independent minister, scholar and writer. 5. Edward Gilbert Herbert, of the Chancery Bar, who died young of diphtheria. 1. Helen Taylor, authoress of Sabbath Bells. Wedgwood. This family is curious for the sporadic character of its ability, as shown by the number of its members and rather distant relationships who have become distinguished. The Wedgwoods must originally have been a pure type because the name was prevalent in the village where the great potter was born and the bearers of it were largely interrelated and followed the same craft. He himself married a Wedgwood who was a third cousin and both his father and grandfather were potters. Meteyard's Life First Generation Josiah Wedgwood, FRS, father of British pottery whose once abundant works now fetch fabulous prices. Second generation, three sons and four daughters. One son deserves notice, viz. Thomas Wedgwood, who died young. His abilities were great. He was an ardent experimentalist and has some claim to rank as the first person who ever made a photograph. See page 7. Third generation, including descendants from the sisters of Josiah Wedgwood, contains 1. Hensley Wedgwood, English Dictionary and Origin of Language. 2. Charles Darwin, FRS, C under Darwin. 3. Sir Henry Holland, Bart, M.D. F.R.S., who died subsequently to my having begun this inquiry. 4. S.H. Parks, M.D. F.R.S., Professor of Hygiene to the Army Medical School. 4th Generation, C. Under Darwin. Statistical Results Let us now look at the near relations of the scientific men from a purely statistical point of view, combining those already quoted with the rest and calculate the proportion of them who have achieved distinction. It appears from my returns, which are rather troublesome to deal with owing to incompleteness of information, that 120 scientific men have certainly not more than 250 brothers, 460 uncles, and 1,200 male cousins who reach adult life. They have somewhat less than 120 fathers and 240 grandfathers, because the list contains brothers and cousins. I will take two groups. 1. Grandfathers and uncles, both paternal and maternal, say about 660 persons. 2. Brothers and male cousins on both sides, 1,450 persons. On the supposition, which is somewhat in excess of the fact that I am dealing with complete information concerning the families of 120 scientific men, I find in the first group of 660 persons, 1. Jeremy Bentham, a great leader of thought and founder of a school of philosophy. 2. Wedgwood, the father of a national industry in art. 3. Compton, 
the inventor of a machine for cotton manufacture which gave a timely impetus to the great national industry. 4. Mascaline, an astronomer royal. 5. Playfair, the scientific head of a Scotch university. 6. William Smith, founder of British geology. 7. Harcourt, the lawgiver and first president of the British Association. 8. Pemberton Milnes, who refused both the secretaryship of state and a peerage. 9. Latrobe, who was to the very worthy sect of the Morovians much what Barclay was to the Quakers, that is to say, not its founder, but a great supporter to it. 10 and 11. Two archbishops, Harcourt of York and Broderick of Gashel. 12. Erasmus Darwin, poet and philosopher of high repute in his day. 13. Isaac Taylor, author of Natural History of Enthusiasm, etc. I will stop here, though it would be easy to extend that list considerably if I took a slightly lower level of celebrity for my limit. Every one of these thirteen men, when he died, was or would have been, if he had not been previously outlived his reputation, the subject of numerous obituary notices, and his death an event of sufficient public interest to warrant his being reckoned as an eminent man. I formally calculated and have since seen no reason to doubt my conclusion that the annual obituary of the United Kingdom does not include more than fifty men who are eminent in that sense. Therefore, this small band of 660 individuals contains almost one-fourth as much eminence as is annually produced by the United Kingdom. A different criterion of eminence may be found in the number of celebrated men reared in the universities, whither a large proportion of the brightest youths of the nation find their way. I examined the lists of honours at Cambridge in the ten years 1820-09, inclusive, and also the four years 1842-5, of which I happen to have some personal knowledge, whence it appeared to me that on the average 660 Cambridge students do not produce more than three men whose general eminence is of equal rank to that of the 13 men in the 660 grandfathers and uncles under consideration. A more exact test and the best of which I can think is to examine into the fate of the boys at large schools. It is not difficult to learn the productiveness of each school as regards eminence, because there are annual gatherings to which former schoolboys who have won distinction are generally invited and not unfrequently come. As men begin to distinguish themselves at 35, and may be supposed willing to attend on such occasions till 70, the notabilities invited to be present at school gatherings present the product of, say, 35 years. I feel sure that 660 middle-class boys do not turn out more than a fraction of one eminent man, though they may turn out many who do well in life and earn fortunes and local repute. The second of the group consists, as already mentioned, of brothers and male cousins, making a total of about 1,450 men. I will examine the achievements of these solely in respect to high university success, partially because several of the cousins are too young to have had time fully to distinguish themselves otherwise. Let us limit ourselves to the following names. The list would be lengthened if we took a lower level. Cambridge, 1. Alderson, both first classic and senior wrangler, that is, first mathematician of his year at Cambridge. 2. Woodhouse, Senior Wrangler. 3. Main, Senior Wrangler. 4. Humphrey, Senior Classic. 5. Scott, Joint Senior Classic. Oxford. Here the method of examination affords no means of ascertaining who is absolutely the first of his year, since the men are grouped alphabetically in classes and not according to their order of merit in those classes. The names I will select are those of men who were in the first class and have subsequently distinguished themselves, viz. 6. Moberly, headmaster of Winchester, now Bishop of Salisbury. 7. Francis Palgrave, critic. 8. Honorary George Broderick, first class both in classics and history, well known as an influential though anonymous writer. It is a remarkable fact or coincidence that five men out of a group of 1,450, or say one out of every 300, should be first in his year in the single university of Cambridge, either in mathematics or in classics. This is about the proportion that exists among the men who actually go to Cambridge, and these, as before mentioned, are no chance selections, but include a large part of the annual pick of the intellectual flower of the whole nation. Moreover, these distinguished brothers and cousins of scientific men are themselves interrelated. The two senior wranglers, Alderson and Woodhouse, 
being first cousins, and the two classics, Scott and Broderick, being first cousins, also both families being, in other respects, rich in ability. We may otherwise appreciate the influence of heredity as distinguished from that of tradition and education by observing the similarity of disposition that sometimes prevails among numerous scattered branches of the same family. The two following extracts from the replies I have received are illustrations of what I mean. 1. My numerous relatives, though unknown to fame, are mostly characterized by a great breadth of thought and rare independence of action. These characteristics seem clearly traced by the writer to a great-grandparent who immigrated from Germany. 2. Counting third cousins, I have scores and scores of relatives and scarcely an unsteady person among them. I have numerous returns in which the writer analyses his own nature and confidently ascribes different parts of it to different ancestors. One correspondent has ingeniously written out his natural characteristics in red, blue and black inks, according to their origin, a method by which its anatomy is displayed at a glance. My data afford an approximate estimate of the ratio according to which effective ability, hereditary gifts plus education plus opportunity, is distributed throughout the different degrees of kinship. They state, 1. The number of kinsmen in the several near degrees, 2. The number of those among them who were in any sense public men, and 3. The number of those who, not being publicly known, had nevertheless considerable reputation among their friends. It is therefore only requisite, after some previous revision, to add the returns together, and to compare the number of distinguished kinsmen in their various degrees with the total number of kinsmen in those degrees. To obtain results whose ratio to one another is the one we are in search of. These conclusions are not materially vitiated by the fact that different correspondents may have different estimates of what constitutes distinction, so long as each writer is consistent to his own scale. I have tried to figure in many ways without any revision at all, with moderate revision and with careful sifting, and I find the proportions to come out much the same in every case. In comparing these with previous results obtained from an analysis of men of much higher general eminence, Hereditary Genius, page 317, I find the falling off in ability from the central figure, the hero of the family, to be less rapid as the distance of the kinship increases. There is, however, one group in that book consisting of divines whose general eminence is not so great as the rest and which also resembles the scientific men in the family distribution of ability. My former figures for 100 divines gave 22 notable fathers, 42 brothers, 28 grandfathers and 42 uncles. My present results for 100 scientific men are 28, 36, 20 and 40 respectively. As regards the relative influence of the paternal and maternal lines, I find close equality. My method of comparison is by setting off paternal grandfathers and paternal uncles against maternal grandfathers and maternal uncles no other near degree of kinship been available for the purpose. My results for 100 scientific men are paternal grandfathers, public characters 10, of high private reputation 3, paternal uncles 13 and 8, making a total on the paternal side of 34. On the other hand, the maternal grandfathers are 11 and 4, maternal uncles 15 and 7, making a total on the maternal side of 37. I leave to other chapter some remarks about the relative value of maternal and paternal educational influences on scientific men. End of chapter 1 of English Men of Science Chapter 2 of English Men of Science by Francis Galton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Leon Harvey Chapter 2 Qualities Energy, size of head, health, perseverance, practical business habits, memory, independence of character, mechanical aptitude, religious bias, truthfulness. In this chapter I will speak of the qualities which the returns specify as most conspicuous in scientific men, and I shall endeavour to make them tell their own tale by quoting anonymous extracts from their communications. Some of these qualities are common to all men who succeed in life. Others, such as the love for science, are more or less special to scientific men. We will begin with the general qualities, with the view of obtaining as exact an idea as may be of the degree in which they are present in the leaders of science of the present day, neither exaggerating nor underestimating. Energy 
When energy or the secretion of nervous force is small, the powers of the man are overtasked by his daily duties, his health gives way, and he is soon weeded out of existence by the process of natural selection. When moderate, it just suffices for the duties and ordinary amusements of his life. He lives, as it were, up to his income, and has nothing to spare. When it is large, he has a surplus to get rid of, or direct, according to his tastes. It may break out in some illegitimate way, or he may utilise it, perhaps in the pursuit of science. It will be seen that the leading scientific men are generally endowed with great energy. Many of the most successful among them have laboured as earnest amateurs in extra professional hours, working far into the night. They have climbed the long and steep ascent from the lower to the upper ranks of life. They have learned where the opportunities of learning were few. They have built up fortunes by perseverance and intelligence, and at the same time have distinguished themselves as original investigators in non-renumerative branches of science. There are other scientific men who possess what is sometimes called quiet energy. Their vital engine is powerful, but the steam is rarely turned fully on. Again, there are others who have fine intellects without much energy, but these later classes are quite in the minority. The typical man of science has been at full work from boyhood to old age, and has exuberant spirits and love of adventure in his short holidays when the engine of his life runs free, temporarily detached from its laborious tasks. We must be on our guard against estimating a man's energy too strictly by the work he accomplishes, because it makes great difference whether he loves his work or not. A man with no interest is rapidly fagged. Prisoners are well nourished and cared for, but they cannot perform the task of an ill-fed and ill-housed labourer. Whenever they are forced to do more than their usual small amount, they show all the symptoms of being overtasked and sicken. An army in retreat suffers in every way, while on the advance, being full of hope, may perform prodigious feats. In the following extracts, I insert everything that seems deserving of mention as regards the energy of either parent. It will be observed how strong is the tendency for the primary quality to be transmitted hereditarily. Speaking generally of these and all other extracts printed in this book, I should give the following explanation. Whenever anything is interpolated by me, it is put in square brackets. All proper names are replaced by dots, because I do not wish to administer to the love of gossip. It is indeed impossible to prevent intimate friends from sometimes guessing the names of the author, but I have taken care that nothing is inserted which can cause annoyance. I have taken some trifling editorial liberties, such as occasionally working the words of the question into the answer, when the latter was too curt to explain itself, and in a few cases the third person has been turned into the first for the sake of uniformity. Extracts from Returns Energy much above the average, 40 cases. 1. Travelling almost continually from 1846 up to the present time. Restless. All life accustomed to extremely rough travel. Often months without house or tent. Of mind, restless. Father. Very energetic, restless. In old age, travelled considerably. Mentally restless. Mother, quiet and delicate. 2. When young, and to estimate thirty or more, worked habitually till two and three a.m., often all night. Travelled much in various climates. Much endurance of fatigue and hard living. Of mind, has risen to the highest position in his branch of science, and conducts an enormous correspondence on a variety of technical and scientific subjects. Father, very considerable energy, both in body and mind. Mother, below the average in bodily energy, but remarkably active mentally. 3. When fishing or shooting, my only occupation during the holidays, I am the whole day on my legs. Of mind, in 13 years I examined and named some 40,000 examples, described some 7,000 species, wrote some 6,000 pages of printed matter, carrying on at the same time a great deal of correspondence. Father, I cannot say. Mother is active the whole day. At the age of 63, she took sole charge of my child, then but a few weeks old nursing it for three years, night and day, energy of mind equal to that of her body. 4. Remarkable energy and active of body, and power of enduring fatigue and going without food. Extremely fond of and an adept at all field sports. Absentious of mind, vigorous pursuit of scientific experiments and investigations of interest and management of money, business transactions, etc. Father, active in field sports has ridden sixty miles before dinner. Abstemious, energetic in mind. 
Mother, much energy, as shown by activity and power of enduring fatigue. Great physical courage and presence of mind in danger. 5. Remarkable for athletic exercises when at Cambridge. In early life encountered great fatigue with the army as blank during the blank war. Father, great activity and immense energy in the practice of his profession, a man of most powerful intellect. 6. I have been and still am a strong walker, both mountaineering and deer stalking. I never knew what it was to be tired, but after the hardest day was ready to start again with six hours sleep. Although in my sixty-seventh year I am still an indefatigable deer stalker. 7. Strong when young, walked many a time fifty miles a day without fatigue, and kept up five miles an hour for three or four hours. Father. Remarkable energy of body up to the age of thirty, as shown. Blank. Of mind. Remarkable energy from early youth to his death. Brought on by accident at seventy-three, when he was actively engaged and ever in preparing for experiments, official and of a very multifarious kind. Mother. Remarkable energy of mind in assisting her father in the preparation of his lectures, and afterwards her husband in his official correspondence and writings. After his death, she wrote largely in magazines, and estimates 85, published, suggestions for, blank, certain improvements in administration. 8. When under 20, have walked 20 miles before breakfast. When about 32, walked 45 miles, dined and danced till 2 in the morning without fatigue. At the age of 26, during 14 days, was only 3 hours per night in bed, and on 2 of the nights was up all night preparing for, blank, certain scientific work. Fond of mountaineering. 9. Considerable energy and power of enduring fatigue. Rough travelling on small mains in blank, partially civilised countries. Have rode myself on a skiff 105 miles in 21 hours whilst undergraduate at blank. Rode in every race during my stay at the university. Rode two years in the university crew, Oxford and Cambridge races. Father. Many examples of his energy in his blank life. Of mind considerable, compiling and writing on a great variety of subjects, whilst at the same time carrying on a system of blank observations, and for years together. Mother, energy of mind very similar to that of my father, joining nightly in blank observations, daily in writing or drawing. 10. Very active in business, preferring walking to the compulsory driving, occupied 14 or 15 hours a day without distress, restlessness kept under conscious restraint, Longing for adventurous travel, but hindered. Mind, I doubt whether anyone in my profession has done more work, if I may reckon the total work done in blank, etc., etc., and I worked nearly as hard while a student. Father, as a young man, an active cricketer and volunteer officer, a very earnest, active man in business, heavily engaged in it from the age of 18. Besides, he took an active part in town affairs and the management of many associations, Mother, a good walker, very active in the management of her house. Although she had a very large family and took most diligent care of them, she was always at work, collecting all manner of things, arranging, describing, corresponding, painting, copying. She was never idle. 11. I seem to possess the same unweariedness as my father, and find myself trotting in the streets as my father used to. Father. Was very untiring. He tells me he has ridden 100 miles in a day. He could walk up one of the North Wales hills when nearly seventy, and used to go long distances in London, passing often from a walk into a run. 12. In early life, occasionally working the night through. Great adroitness at games. Fast runner. Got the price of fencing at. Blank. On board a man of war in 18. Blank. Did feats of agility, such as growing up a rope hand over hand, which none of the midshipmen would attempt. Father. Great amount of quiet energy, in mind, great energy and perseverance, which lasted to the end of his life. Thus he had known little Greek, but studied it when an old man for the sake of his, blank, researches. Also Aramaic. Mother. Active house mother. 13. Habitually travelled by night without interfering with work of any kind carried on during the day. Active habits and great power of enduring fatigue. 14. I was in youth and early manhood bodily active, a good runner and leaper, excelling almost all my school fellows. The school was a large one. In both points, and a persistent walker. In mind, during the best fifty years of my life, I went through a large amount of brain work, and vigorously pursued the several interests indicated 
in the enumeration of my several occupations. Father, in bodily activity much like myself, with the addition that he was a good swimmer, in mind capable of great occasional exertion rather than of sustained effort. Mother, in mind, very energetic, within a limited range, always showed great courage, fortitude, and equanimity. In her nursing duties, whether of young or old, was active, persevering, and remarkably successful. 15. At the age of 60, made a tour, chiefly pedestrian, of four weeks in the Alps, ascended Sima di Jazzi, crossed St. Thidul Pass, walking sometimes 30 miles a day, estimate. 67. Grouse shooting and deer stalking, walk six miles daily to present date. Of mind, see list and dates of works and papers, an enormous amount of work. Father, active disposition, he let his family estate, entered largely into mercantile pursuits, and died abroad. 16. When young, a very quick runner and jumper, good shot with bow and arrow, in middle age walked to extent of 25 miles a day for many months, 40 miles in one day, rarely tired. Of mind, in early life, any amount, provided the support was interesting. 17. At times, great fatigue has been gone through in connection with my profession. In mind, a good deal of continued power of brain work, mental fatigue, is a sensation not known. Father, very energetic. In mind, remarkably so. Having been ruined in early life, he articulated himself to a solicitor when he was 35 years of age, procured good practice, and wrote a small technical book on law. Mother, loved to go through much fatigue. In mind, very energetic. Added greatly to the income of her family by her writings. 18. Active bodily work and absolute necessity of my being. Without it, my epigastrium would gnaw itself into fiddle strings. In mind, my scientific works must answer this question. They are very considerable. Father, decidedly active and energetic, used to go out fossil hunting when it was too late to follow his occupation, which involved out-of-door work lasting all day and fatiguing to the muscles. Mother, very industrious. 19. Excelled at school and college in athletic sports, especially in long jumping, 18 feet. In mind, almost incapable of fatigue up to the age of 38. Usually engaged in literary work until long after midnight. Father, remarkably active habits. A great reader were not engaged in drawing and writing. 20. Excellent walker. Great endurance of fatigue. Facts are given. In mind, active mental effort all my life. Have had abundance of active employment. Am now doing duty as blank. Numerous honorary officers of the first rank in importance and labour. Father. Energetic with considerable endurance. Good swimmer. In mind, he had much the same employment as myself. He took an active share in science, politics and religion. Mother. Active habits. She had great power of doing work and carrying on business. 21. When a boy of 13, I walked 48 miles in one day, 50 the next, and about 20 the third. When grown up, my powers were ordinary, certainly not above average. In mind, indolent, disinclined to work, unless with a large object. N.B. I insert this moderate statement because my correspondent adheres to it verbally, and gives facts and reasons which I cannot controvert. Nevertheless, if energy is to be measured by work actually accomplished, and if my correspondent's work be compared with that of other men, the estimate of his energy will be prodigiously increased. Father. When a young man, he and two brothers walked 60 miles in one day. Much mental energy. Ready for all purposes. When old, he was astonished at the amount of work in blank he did when young. Mother. Ordinary, both bodily and mental. 22. Has done his chief brain work between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., besides all the day labour, rest perfectly during a night railway journey. Father, great energy and very active, capable of enduring great fatigue. 23. Active and energetic from infancy to 84 years of age. In mind, I must leave my works to answer this question, but I believe I have been a hard worker during the whole period of my existence. N.B. No doubt of it. Father, energetic both in body and mind, muscular, a great reader, mother, delicate, but active and intelligent. 24. A strong walker and oarsman can write more rapidly than any man I ever met. 30 folios of 72 words equal to 2,160 words an hour. In mind, I have always worked long hours and very fast. Father, 
remarkable energy and endurance, notwithstanding asthma, very hard working as a blank. Mother, physically weak, but has had a large family, has done a great deal of original as well as of steady work. 25. I am a hard rider with hounds, fond of mountaineering, and not easily tired. Father, an active man all his life, riding every day, and always about, although over eighty. 26. Energy shown by much activity and well side health, power of resisting fatigue. I and one other man were alone able to fetch water for a large party of officers and men utterly prostrated. Other facts given in illustration of undoubted energy. In mind, shown by vigorous and long-continued work on the same subject as twenty years on blank and nine years on blank. Father, great power of endurance, although feeling much fatigue, and after consultations after long journeys, very active, not restless. In mind, habitually very active, as shown in conversation with a succession of people during the whole day. 27. Considerable enduring power in fulfilling any given task or duty. Have dissected continually for three or four weeks, eight or nine hours a day, devoting some sixteen hours to the work at critical times. In mind, considerable. Wrote and superintended first edition of blank, giving instructions to artists regarding from 200 to 300 woodcuts, correcting press, etc. Without assistance, in about seven months, all this in addition to professional work. Hard work for mind as well as body. 28. Energetic. In mind, extraordinarily so, both in administrative and in original work. Father, energetic. Author of, I think, more than 70 scientific memoirs. 29. Formerly great power of railway travel without fatigue. In mind, active and energetic in a very high degree, as shown by the amount of his official and private work. Father, always on horseback, travelled very constantly and rapidly, steady in pursuit of an object. He would break in horses with great skill and patience, would learn languages with great perseverance, even after fifty years of age. Mother, very energetic in inquiries. 30. Great activity at cricket and football up to age of 25. Captain of blank, 11 for 5 years. Used to row a great deal in heavy boats. 31. I possess considerable bodily energy and when young excelled in fencing, swimming and the high jump. In mind, have worked hard with my brain for the last 35 years, almost without intermission. Father, considerable bodily energy and a good pedestrian. Mother, sluggish bodily powers, but in mind most energetic when once roused to action by a subject that interested her feelings. 32. Sufficiently patient of ordinary fatigue, cold and hunger to enable me to enjoy travelling in unfrequented countries when my companions suffered much discomfort. In mind, can commonly work from 12 to 14 hours a day without any remarkable amount of exhaustion. Father, capable of enduring fatigue. 33. This is a case of extraordinary mental activity as shown by evidence which I do not feel justified in quoting. It was rewarded by a success notwithstanding serious impediments in boyhood. Father, a most energetic man, all for practical pursuits. Mother, an unusually strong mind and steadied love and search for knowledge. 34. Walking from Cambridge to London in a day. At the age of 68, it ascended the Piers Corvatch in the Engadine. In mind, facts evidencing considerable energy are quoted. Father, fond of exercise, a good walker. Mother, decidedly active bodily habits. 35. I am decidedly lazy, but with due stimulus could always get through a great amount of physical work, and was rather the better for it. In mind, as a boy, I worked for three months all day and all night, with not more than four or five hours sleep. When full of a subject and interested in it, I have written for seven or eight hours without interruptions, and without feeling any notable fatigue. 36. In early life as a boy, I was engaged in business from twelve to fourteen hours a day, yet always found time to study and make my own instruments. Later on, my studies in scientific work were always accomplished after business hours, and it was generally my habit to commence work after dinner and to work in science until two, three, or four in the morning, and to begin work in business again at nine. I never thought of rest if I had anything in hand of interest. Father, remarkably active and capable of sustaining an amount of bodily exertion which should have destroyed the health of most men. 
For example, I have known him sustain great fatigue for 18 hours out of the 24 hour for months at a stretch. A great walker, in mind, of indomitable activity, a great reader, always at work in applying discoveries in blank to the arts, an untiring worker in anything he undertook. Mother, Busily active, great and rapid reader of current literature, perhaps, and read almost every book of interest in fiction which appeared. 37. Used to work all day at business and one half or three quarters of the night at science. From Saturday afternoons to Monday mornings would walk 40 to 50 miles in pursuit of a branch of natural history. Could work hard at business all day and a very anxious business. And at evening and night would work hard at two branches of science found a wonderful relief in science father energetic in travelling great energy in business thirty eight for several years was engaged in full medical practice at the same time was a lecturer on blank and engaged in investigations on for which the royal medal was awarded by the royal society father and mother both of active habits thirty nine in professional life i have often been up three successive nights without distress but do not like a fourth if it came Consider that my limit in mind wrote blank, a considerable work, between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m., after professional hours. All the time that I have devoted to science has been stolen from strictly professional engagements, but more often from myself. 40. Considerable power in earlier days of enduring mental fatigue and of taking up without difficulty a considerable range of subjects. Example. I was for a little while at 17 to 20 in teaching and I contrived in my scanty intervals of leisure to read a very large quantity of Greek and Latin, and to become, without any external assistance, a very fair mathematician. My correspondent occupies a high official position in which considerable mathematical knowledge is essential. I learned also Italian at this time. 41. I should say considerable, judging by the number of things I have been able to learn and to do since adult age. 42. I think considerable in mind have commonly had it said of me that it was wonderful how I got through so much work. Father, was well known as a hard worker. Mother, a great reader, taught herself Greek and Hebrew and learnt German, a letter life, to read Luther and other theological writers in the original. A great student of theology. Cases of energy below the average, two cases. 1. No remarkable energy of body. In mind, never capable of a large amount of brain work. For years have regarded myself as defective in brain power. The actual performance of this correspondent is considerable and of a very high order. Father. In early life fond of athletic sports and an enthusiastic sportsman. Energy of mind very remarkable, shown in early university and professional life and all subsequent occupations. He wrote a large number of publications on subjects of blank and blank controversy. Mother. Energy of mind remarkable, zeal in pursuits of interest excessive. 2. Constitutionally languid, with a strong wish for greater energy and more power of enduring fatigue. In mind, energetic, as far as health permits. Much occupied professionally, but when well capable of vigorous following up the science of blank in leisure hours. Father, energetic in body as far as his health allowed. In mind, very energetic. His brain work from an early age was very large in amount, and he was vigorous and sanguine about anything he undertook. Mother, very languid, incapable of any bodily exertion, very little energy of mind, too languid to take much interest in anything beyond her own family. Size of head. I may mention that energy appears to be correlated with smallness of head, a fact which is well illustrated here, although the average circumference of head among the scientific men is great. Energy is also, as we have seen, strongly marked among them, but it is much more strongly marked among those who have small heads. I have 99 returns, many of which I have verified myself, using the hat maker's whalebone hoop, and measuring inside the hats. It appears that the average circumference of an English gentleman's head is 22 and one quarter to 22 and a half inches. Now I have only 13 cases under 22 inches, but 8 cases of 24 inches or upwards. The general scientific position of the small headed who are mostly slender but not necessarily short and large headed men seems equally good but the fact is conspicuous that out of the thirteen of the former there are only two or three who have not remarkable energy and out of the eight of the latter there is only one who has 
A combination of great energy and great intellectual capacity is the most effective of all conditions, but like the combination of swiftness and strength in muscular powers, it is very rare. Health The excellence of the health of the men in my list is remarkable, considering that the majority are of middle and many of advanced ages. One quarter of them state that they have excellent or very good health. A second quarter have good or fair. A third have had good health since they attained manhood, and only one quarter make complaints or reservations. Here are two examples of excellent health in which some details are given. 1. Only absent from professional duties two days in thirty years. Only two headaches in my life. The next is from a correspondent who is between seventy and eighty years of age. 2. Never ill for more than two or three days except with neuralgia. No surgical operations except inoculation, drawing of one tooth, and cutting of corns. I may add a characteristic biographical extract from The Times, October 31st, 1873, relating to the late Sir Henry Holland, who was on my list. Certain it is, as all who have fallen in with him by sea or land will attest, that he might be seen in all climates, in the Arctic regions or the tropics, on the prairies or the pyramids, in precisely the same attire, the black dress coat in which he hurried from house to house in Mayfair. Yet he never had a serious illness till his last. There was not a day, probably not an hour, when he could not boast of the mens sana in corpore sano, and without headache or heartache he attained the extraordinary age of eighty-six. It is positively startling to observe in these returns the strongly hereditary character of good and indifferent constitutions. I have classified the entries, each by giving the health of the scientific man, of his father, and of his mother respectively, and find as follows. First, a long row of such terms as these, excellent, 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 or good, good, good. Then comes another row in which some ailment is specified by the scientific man as affecting himself, and as having also affected one or other of his parents. Examples. 1. Excellent, but hay fever. Father, excellent, but severe hay fever. 2. Good in early life, subject to headache. Father, good, subject to headache. 3. Delicate in early life, one lung seriously affected. Mothers, delicate and physical. I can find only two cases, neither very strongly marked, in which both parents are described as unhealthy, although marriages between such persons are not infrequent. The returns seem to show that the issue of these marriages are barely capable of pushing their way to the front ranks of life. All statistical data concur in proving that healthy persons are far more likely than others to have healthy progeny, and this truth cannot be too often illustrated until it has taken such hold of the popular mind that considerations of health and energy shall be of recognised importance in questions of marriage, as much so as the probabilities of rank and fortune. I may mention as a fact that corroborates my belief in the exceptionally good physique of scientific men that I find the average height of those who have sent me returns to be half an inch above that of their fathers. Perseverance Steady perseverance is the third quality on which great stress is laid, but this might have been anticipated, and it is unnecessary to quote many instances. Here are a few. I have probably beyond the average steadiness of determination, even when the subject is distasteful. 2. Steadiness decidedly marked. 3. Determination never to leave unaccomplished a matter once taken in hand. 4. Great continuity and steadiness. 5. Steady and intense perseverance. 6. Very persevering, not discouraged by defeat. 7. Determination to succeed when possible. My motto being, whatever thy hand fighteth to do, do it with all they might, for the night soon cometh when no man can work. 1. I do all things at a white heat, but never tire of the pursuit. 9. Continuous pursuit of certain studies from an early age. 10. Steadiness and perseverance in the pursuit of an object that is my most distinctly marked peculiarity. 11. The most prominent are perseverance and industry. A willing mind and determination to persevere is, in my opinion, the most direct road to success. We must, however, exercise a sound judgment in the selection of subjects on which to exercise our thoughts. I do not think it necessary to quote the instances where either parent is also spoken of as being remarkably persevering. These may be taken for granted. I find that the father is referred to in strong terms eight times, and the mother only twice. 
As is set off to the above, impulsiveness is not confessed to by a single physicist, chemist, or mechanician. It is equally absent in their parents, with the exception of the mother of one of them. Among the remaining men of science, I only find five cases, but these are mostly combined with some tenacity of purpose, and they are all inherited. Practical Business Habits Some prevalence of practical business habits might also have been anticipated, but they proved to be much more common than I had expected. Among those who have sent me returns, I count no less than 17 who are active heads of great commercial undertakings. There are also 10 medical men in the highest rank of practice, and 18 others who fill or who have filled important official posts. Here are some answers to my special inquiries. 1. A most eminent biologist wrote as follows, in reply to the inquiry, whether he had any special taste bearing on scientific success, in addition to those for his own light of investigation. I have no special talent except for business, as evinced by keeping accounts, being regular in correspondence, and investing money very well. It is clear that method and order are essential to the man who hopes to deal successfully with masses of details. 2. I believe I may say that my organ of order is highly developed. Of my collection of some 7,000 birds, skins, every one is always in its place, ticketed with name, etc., all by my own hand. I spend much time, perhaps too much, in putting things straight. 3. I believe I am reckoned a good chairman in public meetings, and I always find that administrative and other work gravitates towards my hands. 4. My professional life is strictly methodical. Every working day is still mapped out into hours, half hours, and quarters. Fully one half of those who state that they possess business habits in a decided degree accredit one or both of their parents with the same faculty. Only two of my correspondents speak of being deficient in business capacities. Both these are physicists. The following quotation may with propriety be inserted here, although the first named quality independence is the subject of a future chapter. I attribute all the knowledge I have acquired and my success I may have had chiefly to three qualities, all of which I believe I inherited. First, independence of judgment, which prompted me to learn for myself what I wanted to know. Secondly, earnestness, determination, and perseverance in acquiring such knowledge, often under difficulties, and in the face of routine business occupation. And thirdly, a business-like, practical, logical way of looking at things, which enabled me to direct attention to the important and relevant, neglecting the unimportant and irrelevant points in which I had to study and do. Memory Memory is very variable in power and character, perhaps no other qualities more so. It is an important ingredient in that aggregate of faculties which form general scientific ability, as is shown by the fact that about one quarter of the men on my list possess it in high degree, but it is not an essential one because it is defective in about one case in fourteen. A good memory is of greater importance to the young student who has much to learn than to the advanced philosopher who has chiefly to reflect and who knows where to refer for information. Memory is usually defective in persons of small ability, but not invariably so. Even among idiots it may be sharp. There are two cases of this record in the autobiography of the late Mrs. Somerville, page 92. One cannot but suspect some exaggeration in the statements and feel regret that the cases were not fully inquired into, both as regards the precise power of memory and the degree of development of the other faculties. She says the first idiot... He never failed to go to Kirk, and on returning home he could repeat the sermon word for word, saying, Here the minister coughed, here he stopped to blow his nose. She then speaks of another idiot who knew the Bible so perfectly that if you asked him where such a verse was to be found, he could tell without hesitation and repeat the chapter. I have sorted such of the replies as our interest into the following groups. 1. Good verbal memory, as for prose and poetry, six cases. 2. Good memory for facts and figures, 9 cases. 3. Memory for form, 6 cases. 4. Good memory for names in natural history, 4 cases. 5. Good memory, no details, 5 cases. 6. Fitful and peculiar memory, 6 cases. 7. Bad memory, 7 cases. Total number of noteworthy cases, 43. I have not included in the above a few instances in which the scientific man has described his own memory simply as good, nor others in which he has made no remark, except that one of his parents had very good memory. The hereditary character of this quality is abundantly illustrated.
Good verbal memory. As for prose and poetry. 1. Very great, both for facts and words. I could in my earlier days often retain poetry after two perusals, and once learned it, it was seldom forgotten. I have seldom met a quicker or more retentive memory in any one. 2. After reading over a lecture or a speech of an hour's duration three times, can recollect nearly the words as written for eight or ten days. I am informed verbally by this correspondent that he is obliged to abstain from writing out his addresses, etc., beforehand. Otherwise, he has found the memory of what he wrote to be so strong and exacting as to make it difficult to him to deviate from it and accommodate his language to the current temper of his audience. Mother, excellent memory. 3. Considerable, both verbal and objective. Great facility in quotations, familiarity with large collections of coins and specimens. Father and mother, both good memories. 4. In childhood, all the psalms, old version, much old English poetry. Afterwards, nearly the whole Latin grammar, Eton, Virgil, Ovid, Lucan, still later, considerable parts of the Iliad, Odyssey, etc., could be and partially can still be repeated ex memoria zoological, botanical, mineralogical, and paleontological names in abundance. 5. My memory was very good. I remember as a boy to have read Schiller's Thirty Years' War. I could afterwards, without effort, say pages of the work by heart. 6. At school I used to learn in a single evening 100 lines of Virgil and repeat them correctly in the morning. Father, very good. Good memory for facts and figures. 1. Next to no verbal memory... Good memory for facts and figures. 1. Next to no verbal memory, but good for facts small or great which will fit into any chain of reasoning. 2. Of moderate verbal memory, but strongly retentive of facts and figures so far as they are related to any subject on or in which I was engaged. Father. Memory very retentive, but not systematic. He had a great amount of information, but had not great acquirements. His familiarity with scripture was, however, remarkable. Mother, very retentive for small facts and figures. 3. My memory of things learned early in life, as dates, rules, examples of grammar, etc., very retentive, but of all isolated facts of subsequent occurrence, as the birthdays of my children and the dates of events of my life, I am singularly destitute of retentive power. On the other hand, of whatever is linked by rational association with any subject in which I take an interest, my memory is very good. Father. The power of his memory was shown by the great range of his requirements. He had greater power of remembering isolated facts than I have. 4. I should say far above the average. I can now refer to notebooks of 30 years past and select a special observation. In other words, it is a capital working memory. I never tried to learn pages of poetry, etc. In this I should probably have failed. 5. Memory exceedingly strong and retentive, especially of dates, figures and events. Father and mother, both had good memories. 6. Great memory for figures, can get up pages for examination before committees and dismiss them from memory afterwards. Strong recollection of scenery. 7. Very retentive memory, especially of acts, circumstances and individuals. 8. Never kept a diary. Clear remembrance of events in childhood with their dates in every year from the age of 6 onwards. Solve problems better out of doors than in the study can forget useless knowledge such as formulae, rules, gossip, etc. very fast. 9. Bad memory for names and dates, but good as regards facts or circumstances. Principles in physical science are clearly retained. Father, excellent memory for historical events, including dates and names in ancient and modern history. Mother, moderately good. Good memory for form. 1. Mother most treacherous except in certain respects. Vivid and generally very accurate as to places and visual images. As to thousands and perhaps tens of thousands of specimens and plants can remember the exact spot where each was gathered. As to a multitude of facts that should have interested me, my memory is a blank and the original impression revived in difficulty if at all. Very retentive and accurate as to the sequence of impressions from early childhood onwards. Father. Remarkably retentive memory, quoting long passages from classical authors not seen for a very long time previous. Shortly before his death at 73, recited a long passage from Gibbon, not read for 50 years before. Mother, memory not reliable generally, but clinging strongly to special scenes and events. 
I recognized most of the animal forms which I have previously examined, but I forgot easily the details of their structure, also their systematic names. Specific, not generic. Likewise, I have a good memory for faces, but not for names of persons. Could never remember historical dates. 3. Great power of remembering forms and points of objective interest. None of numbers or abstract arguments. Languages, poetry, etc. Soon lost if not kept up. 4. Strong local memory, especially of scenery. 5. Very good memory for ideas and general notions, also of persons and places seen. Verbal memory, not at all good. Mother, good memory. 6. Great memory for faces and objects once seen. A good memory for faces, for locality, for things, for events, for scientific facts, but not particularly good for figures or quantities, except in all necessary routine, as in prescribing and in subjects of lecture. Never fail to recall what I desired in my lectures. Father, an excellent memory, was a very first-rate whist player. Mother, an excellent memory, played a capital game at whist. Good memory for names in natural history. The power of recollecting a multitude of grotesque and barbarous names which all naturalists must possess to a considerable degree and which seems so extraordinary to persons who are not naturalists is hardly alluded to in these returns. It would appear that our most eminent naturalists are not very specially gifted among their fellow workers in this respect. Here are a few cases of a rather good memory of the kind. 1. Memory strong up to the age of 38. Still good and capable of recognising and naming probably between two and three thousand species of animals and plants, including fossil forms. Father, remarkable, capable of accurately repeating from memory the substance of speeches delivered at clerical and other meetings. 2. Retentive of botanical names, rather deficient in other respects, especially as to persons. 3. Retentive for nomenclature, but not for numbers or history. During practitional life, I have gone over the foraminiferae and remembered all their names. Good memory. No particular is given. 1. Very remarkable retentiveness of memory. Father good, mother very good. Full of anecdote. 2. Very good memory as far as my 85th birthday. 3. Very good. Father good. 4. Very retentive but not exactly accurate. 5. Retentive memory for what was of interest, and very accurate. Father, retentive. 6. Very good as a boy and young man. Fitful and peculiar memory. 1. Occasionally remarkable, but very fitful. I have occasionally been able to repeat pages after once or twice reading. At other times, it is below the average. A power of eliminating and retaining the salient points of what I read if it interests me, but very bad memory for facts and details. 2. Although I can speak for an hour or two from a few notes, I could not repeat correctly a few sentences from memory. Father, remarkable for good verbal memory, could repeat pages of poetry and speeches without mistake, a striking contrast to my own memory. 3. My father and myself have memories of the same character, treacherous in matters of business, and very retentive of scraps of verse read over and learnt long ago. When my father was to have met me, a little boy returning from school the end of the half, he would forget all about it. My engagements sometimes suffer, blank, from similar forgetfulness. 4. Memory very retentive in regard to incidents and events, but could never learn by rote except with great effort. Often surprise my patients by recollection of their symptoms, but am often at a loss to connect their names with their faces. Father, Memory remarkably retentive, especially as to the various events of his life and time. 5. Memory very bad for dates and for learning by rote, but extraordinarily good in retaining a general or vague recollection of many facts. Father. Wonderful memory for dates. In old age, he told a person reading aloud to him a book only once read in his youth. The passages which were coming. He knew the birthdays and those of the deaths, etc., of all his friends and acquaintances. 6. A peculiar memory, bad for names of persons, plants, places, etc., good for subjects connected with others, not bad for numbers. Father, a most marvellously retentive memory. He could relate minute details of historical occurrences, names of actors in politics, almost all he had ever read. He was a great reader, and was in consequence a most lively companion. Mother, not very good. Bad memory. 1. 
a physicist informs me that his memory is unable to retain even the commonest constants in habitual use, and that the selection of his special line of investigation was governed by his sense of this disability. 2. Bad memory. From boyhood, incapable of learning school tasks by heart, though retaining a knowledge of principles and methods. 3. I have a very poor memory. I was once a whole fortnight in recovering the name of blank, but I got it at last. I consider that all attempts at making me learn poetry, and in particular Latin poetry at school, were gross mistakes. I was never benefited in the least. Reasoning was my forte, and I could never do anything by rote. 4. A bad memory, especially for names. 5. Not possessed of a retentive memory, either in small matters or large ones, except in those in which I take a special interest. 6. I was always slow at learning. 7. Memory not retentive. Very much under the influence of association and suggestion. Father. Memory very retentive as to principles, facts, instance. Not much so as to names of persons and objects. Mother. Not retentive. Independence of character. We now come to the qualities that are of special service to scientific men. Those already mentioned, of energy, health, steadiness of pursuit, business habits and memory, being of general utility. The first of these is independence of character. Fifty of my correspondents show that they possess it in excess, and it only two is below par. Here are a few examples. 1. Left, estimated 12, that is, ran away from a school where I had received injustice from the master. 2. Opinions in almost all respects opposed to those in which I was educated. 3. I have always taken my own independent line. My heresy prevented my advancement. 4. Preference for whatever is not the fashion. Not popular, not rich, not very able to help itself, yet with qualities unworthily overlooked or unjustly oppressed. The home atmosphere, which the scientific men breathed in their youth, was generally saturated with the spirit of independence. Examples 1. My father was extremely independent, in some respects more so than I am. He never altered the fashion of his dress, he never took off his hat to anyone in his life, and never addressed anyone as a squire. 2. My father was a liberal when liberalism, then styled Jacobinism, was highly obnoxious. An early denouncer of slavery, an advocate of religious liberty, a free trader when the world was protectionist, and an opponent of unrighteous war when war was most popular. It was for mitigating our criminal code when hanging was regarded as the sheet anchor, and, in a word, was politically and socially a very independent spirit. 3. My father, an exceedingly humane and courageous man, who was a master in the Royal Navy, would never, unless compelled, attend the flogging of a seaman, a punishment mercilessly and unsparingly administered in his days, 1800-1815. 4. It was marked in my father, he held Jacobite opinions, when it was not very safe to hold them. 5. Maintenance by my father of religious and political creeds at a time when these creeds were unpopular and often disqualifying. In confirmation of the assertion that the scientific men were usually brought up in families characterised by independence of disposition, I refer to the strange variety of small and unfashionable religious sects to which they or their parents belonged. We all know that Dalton, the discoverer of the atomic theory, and Dr. Young, of the undulatory theory of light, were both Quakers, and that Faraday was a Sandemanian. So I find in these returns numerous cases of Quaker pedigree, and I know of one man, not as yet technically on my list, who was born a Sandemanian. There are also representatives of several other small sects, as Moravians and Bible Christians, and the Unitarians are numerous. It will be understood that the object of saying this is not to throw light on the religious tendencies of the scientific men, concerning which I shall have almost immediately to speak, because so offhand a statement would mislead, but to prove that they and their parents had the habit of doing what they preferred, without considering the fashion of the day. The man of science is thoroughly independent in character. Mechanical Aptitude there is a prevalent taste for mechanics among scientific men, whose peculiarity it is to be interested in things more than in persons. One would have expected to find it developed among physicists, and, as a fact, eight of them possess it in a high degree, and similarly among mechanicians and engineers, all of whom must possess it, and four of whom testify to it, but it seems just as strong among the rest. Here are instances and extracts. Chemistry 1. 
constructed a reflecting telescope with 12-inch aperture. 2. Ground polished and silvered a 7-inch glass speculum and mounted it equatorially. Geology. 3. Considerable mechanical skill. Biology. 4. Always fond of constructing. School nickname. Archimedes. If I had followed my profession and should have been very successful as an engineer. 5. Very fond of mechanical contrivances. Invented and made my own toys as a child. Mechanical tastes are still largely indulged in intervals of leisure. 6. Special love of mechanics. A good amateur, cabinet maker and blacksmith. Made lithotrites. 7. Talent for mechanics. 8. Was extremely ingenious in devising modes of preserving and exhibiting objects of natural history. 9. Strong natural inclination towards mechanism. His present profession was accidental and against the grain. 10 and 11. Aptitude for mechanism. 12. A decided turn for mechanical pursuits, both in arrangement and construction. Statistics. 13. Fond of and quick in understanding machinery. 14. I always took great interest in mechanical improvement. 15. I often feel a positive pain in passing an object of which I do not comprehend the meaning and construction. Religious bias. It appears that out of every ten scientific men, seven call themselves members of the established churches of England and Scotland, or of the now established Church of Ireland, and three belong to one or more of the following sects, which I name in the order in which they are most numerously represented. 1. None whatsoever. 2. Established church with qualification. 3. Unitarian. 4. Nonconformist. 5. Wesleyan. 6. Catholic. 7. Bible Christian. There is much Quaker and even some Moravian blood, but there are none who have sent me returns who still profess these creeds. The creeds of the parents are somewhat more varied than the above, and the Unitarian element is stronger. The religious feeling of men of science is necessarily of a peculiar character. Being thoughtful men, they are probably more occupied with religious ideas than the generality of people, but being exacting of evidence and questioners of authority, they sturdily object to much that others accept easily. But what is religion? It is one of the vaguest of words. Let us try to express ourselves more clearly. I think we may assume that the general tendency of scientific men is to take a philosophic view of life, that is, to show some disregard of the petty, transient events which chiefly absorb the attention of mean minds, and to feel most at peace when their thoughts are reposing on the larger and more enduring aspects of the moral and material world. Also, it would be easy to show that no class in the community are more active as philanthropists than scientific men. But these tendencies do not cover the meaning of the phrase religious bias in its technical sense. So far as I understand that sense, it compromises three elements. 1. Great prevalence of the intuitive sentiments, so much so that conflicting matters of observation are apt to be laid aside out of sight and mind. The intuitive sense of a supreme God who communes with our hearts and directs us. 2. A sense of extreme sin and weakness, as expressed by the liturgical phrase, no power of ourselves to help ourselves. Though the weakness of our mortal nature, we can do no good thing without thee, etc. 3. Revelation of a future life, and of other matters variously interpreted by different sects, with more or less satisfy the intuitive sentiments. I did not enter into these details in framing my questions, but simply asked in general terms whether or no my correspondents had a strong religious bias. The interpretation I put on the answers, which are subjoined, is that religion, in the sense of the third paragraph, is not actively accepted by many of those who describe themselves as religiously inclined. They seem singularly careless of dogma and exempt from mysterious terror. Also considering the independence of their disposition, their energetic temperament and healthful physique, I should think that religion, in the sense of the second paragraph, that of feeling sinful and weak, would not express the views of many of them. Therefore I look on the intuitive sentiments, as described in the first paragraph, connected with a philosophic frame of mind and a tendency to achieve philanthropy, as the most likely meaning of the phrase religious bias, when it is used without any qualification by my correspondents, especially by those who are Unitarians. In this sense, at least, there appear to be about 18 instances of scientific men who have a decided religious bias being, I should estimate, at the rate of two or more in every ten. But I am not able to state with certainty how many of these are religious in the sense of all the three paragraphs. Religious sentiments weak, accompanied with more or less scepticism. 1. Being compelled to attend frequent chapels at college, he, for ten years afterwards, 
refused to enter either church or chapel. 2. The negative tendencies of my family may be absence of pity. 3. Religious feeling not great. 4. Skeptical. 5. Not much religious bias except in a boundless admiration of nature. 6. I gave up common religious belief almost independently from my own reflection. 7. Bias towards freedom of thought in religious matters. Intellectual interest in religious topics. 1. Entertained at an early age independent views regarding the resurrection and salvation of the heathen, which led to frequent disputes. 2. At school I became sceptic, and even worked out, in my own somewhat, at that time, reserved mind, a kind of idealism. I afterwards had a phase of religious fervour, but worked through it. 3. Given to theological ideas and not reticent about them. 4. Instinctive or original religious bias, though this may be in part due to early training. I take considerable pains in investigation of religious matters, one of my amusements being the collection of a considerable theological library, with the books of which I am familiar. Dogmatic interest. I have no more doubt about the plenary inspiration of scripture than I have about the simplest axiom in mathematics. I class this exception reply under dogmatic interest, because the remainder of the writer's brief communication highly suggests the dependent frame of mind that is characteristic of pity e.g., never received or asked a single favour or a single farthing for anything I ever wrote or did. Religious bias. 1. Religious bias. 2. Of a religious bias of thought. 3. Religious views liberal but strongly anti-materialistic. 4. Early religious impressions strong, but have, on the dogmatic side, quite disappeared. The belief in a permanent antithesis between good and evil, irrespective of utilitarian results, has survived, with no keen sense of the need of a dogmatic basis for the belief. 5. Much religious bias of thought from early education. 6. I have been the more biased towards religion, in that my father and maternal grandfather lived it and did not prate about it. I am personally only a combination of these two men in this respect. Please take the sense of what I have written, and not the words. 7. Religious bias of thought decided. 8. Although firmly and thoroughly believing in Christianity and accepting it as the guide of my life, as far as I can understand it, being also a regular attendant of the Church of England, still I cannot admit the right of that or any other church to teach dogmatically what truths are necessary for my salvation, and the feelings which ever cause me to resent any interference with the liberty of conscience are quite as strong in me as they were in the breast of my ancestor, when he gave up the land of his birth and property more than three hundred years ago. My correspondent has shown marked instances of independence of character, and has descended maternally from both Flemish and French religious refugees, and paternally from an English nonconformist who left his country and settled in America. 9. It is difficult to estimate one's own peculiarities, but I believe I may credit myself with more of the usual amount of blank and religious bias of thought. I have mixed and worked with Christians of most of the Protestant churches. 10. Strong religious feeling. My intention on entering blank was to devote myself to a missionary life in China, but my unexpected success in blank persuaded my friends to induce me to abandon my purpose on the grounds that I might serve God better in my new sphere at home. I yielded to their arguments with great reluctance. 11. Intensely religious, formerly in the evangelical sense. A tract distributor, promoter of prayer meetings, Bible classes, etc. Excessive distaste to novels and fictions in any shape. See Indifference to Dogma, page 137. 12. I was brought up an ordinary member of the church, but ultimately came to the conclusion that blank was essentially illogical. Blank. I had the happiness of seeing my mother follow me into the blank church. I regret that I am unable with property to give fuller extracts from the most interesting and instructive replies of this correspondent. Religious bias with intellectual scepticism. 1. I have not cultivated independence of judgment in religious matters. I have shrunk from so doing in order to retain peace for my varied studies. 2. Much religious bias of thought, but no respect for revealed religion as a base for such a bias. 3. Religious bias towards natural theology strong, as distinguished from dogma of any kind. 4. I have, perhaps a religious bias from early habits and associations, rather than from temperament, but I have always had more pleasure in sacred than in secular music, which perhaps shows the predominance of the emotional tendency. 5. 
a profound religious tendency capable of fanaticism, but tempered by no less profound theological scepticism. Next, as regards the effect of dogmatic teaching, or of creed on research, I had expected it to have been much more deterrent and hindering than the answers warrant. The suicide of the geologist Hugh Miller, whose brain gave way under the conflict between dogmatic creed and scientific doubt, is a terrible tale. One would have thought that the anathemas from the pulpits against most new scientific discoveries, as soon as they become capable of popular application, such as geological history, antiquity of man, and Darwinism, must have deterred many, and, as I have already shown, few of the sons of clergymen are on my list. Nevertheless, in answers to my direct inquiry, has the religious creed taught in your youth had a deterrent effect on the freedom of your researches? I am met with overpowering majorities of negatives. Seven or eight say no, justifying their assertion by various reasons to one who says yes, as is shown by the appended replies. These may be sorted into the four following groups. 1. No. Deterrent effect. 39 cases. 2. None. With emphasis. 12 cases. Examples. None whatever. Not in the least. Not in the slightest. Decidedly not. Certainly not. 3. None with various classes of reasons why it had not, 14 cases. 4. Has had a good and not a bad effect, 8 cases. Further specimens of the first two groups no, with or without emphasis, are needless, but I will give extracts from the remainder divided under convenient heads. Have no dread of inquiry, 1. I do not think so. At the time when I held strongly the blank dogmatic system, I never could apprehend any dread of the results of free inquiry, 2 none whatever, absolute and fearless faith in the truth. 3. I was left free to choose my own religion, and I believe that there is no real antagonism between revealed religion and the study of nature. Religion and science have different spheres. 1. No, it, religious creed, has no point of contact with chemistry. Indifference to dogma. 1. Not in the slightest degree, but the method of science has taught me not to put any confidence in creeds or dogmatic statements of any kind. There is correspondent is the tract distributor, etc., of 11 of those having religious bias in page 133. Liberality of early religious teaching. 1. None. The teacher was not severe or exclusive in any degree. It was the ordinary teaching of the Church of England. 2. My religious creed from infancy was that of freedom. I was not taught creed or dogma, and had, therefore, the great advantage of not having to fight my way out of darkness into light. 3. I learnt no creed in my youth. 4. I had no religious instruction at school. 5. No. Freedom of thought was always made a part of the creed practically taught me. 6. No religious creed was ever taught to me. 7. None whatever. In fact, no creed was taught me. 8. My religious freedom has enabled me to look every scientific question fairly in the face. 9. There was no religious coercive education at home, notwithstanding my mother's strong personal religious bent. On the contrary, her influence was quite in the direction of free inquiry, in which she largely indulged herself. My school religious teaching had no effect that I can perceive, either on my intellect or imagination. Its chief result was to make me detest the drudgery of learning catechisms and sitting through dreary sermons. 2, 3, 6, 7, 8 are children of Unitarian parents. Have early abandoned creeds. 1. At estimate 13... I disbelieved as thoroughly as I do now in the religious creed that of the Church of England in which I was brought up, and I had realised Berkeleyan idealism by my own road. Compare this with the reply, too, from a different correspondent in page 130 in the selection. Intellectual interest in religious topics, too. None whatever. I have long since wholly rejected religious creeds. 3. I gave up common religious belief almost independently from my own reflection. This quotation is repeated from the last section. The writer's reply to the question of which we are now speaking was a simple no, and had been classified as such. The religious creed has had a good effect on freedom of research. 1. None. i.e. no deterrent effect. Rather the contrary. 2. On the contrary. 3. Quite the reverse. 4. I think none whatever. I have had to overcome some prejudices, but my true religious life has been cognate with my scientific one, and the former has stimulated rather than crippled the later. 5. Certainly not. On the contrary, it has had clearly the very best effect. 6. Not a deterrent effect. 
but it acted as a guide. 7. Never deterred. Now acts as a direct stimulant, since it appears to me that the cultivation of a naturally implanted intellectual tendency is a religious duty. The most pernicious influence to which I was subjected was that arising from J. Stuart Mill, who took me a long time to work through the sensationalist empirical philosophy, and to come out at the other side. 8. No, but the scientific system incalculated long prevented me giving my religious feelings and aspirations full sway. Has had some deterrent effect. 1. Certainly the narrow-ism of early youth made me, for a long time, a timid thinker. 2. To a certain extent, yes, not in philosophical research, but I shrink from the disturbance of mind, not fear of ultimate consequences, which I know would follow, diving into certain questions of the day, connected with early religious teachings. 3. No. For some time it may have hindered me. 4. It certainly would have had the tendency, though not that effect, if my researches had taken certain directions. 5. Would have been so had I not fought against it. 6. The biblical faith prevented my getting good geological views for many years by having set my thoughts in the old grooves, and thus limited them. 7. I think not. I emancipated myself from dogmatic trammels early in life, but not without a struggle. 8. After about ten years' careful consideration of the facts, called by theology, seeming contradictions of science, I finally discarded the pentateuchal spectacles which I had previously looked at certain phenomena. I laid to early theological teaching so much hindrance in the quest of the most precious of our possessions, truth. Truthfulness A curiosity about facts is much spoken of, and implied in the answers to my questions. In a few cases it is combined with a curious repugnance to works of avowed fiction. A hunger for truth is a frequent ingredient in the dispossession of the abler men of every career, but in all probability it is felt most strongly and continuously by men of science. The most clearly marked characteristic of scientific society seems to me to lie in the careful accuracy with which facts and anecdotes of all kinds are related. I have had the good fortune to be acquainted with a large family circle whose curiosity about facts and practice of scrupulous and, so to speak, artistic truthfulness continuously excite my admiration. It has not unfrequently happened to me to hear a remark or statement which I had made to one of its members, alluded to by another, in which case I have been unusually astonished at the precision with which it was repeated. The repetition of the statement retained the precise shade of sense that I originally intended to convey, yet it was almost always presented in a simpler and more striking form. The essentials had been truthfully adhered to, the non-essentials were pruned off and the language was improved. The rarity of a faculty like this is easily tested by the experience of the well-known game of Russian scandal, and has probably been impressed on most of us when we have discovered some misinterpretations of what we did or said. Truthfulness of expressions adds greatly to the charm of life. It gives a grateful sense of confidence towards those who are distinguished for it, and it makes conversation more real and far more interesting. There is an exact parallel between truthfulness of expression in speech and that of delineation in drawing. In the earliest sketch, it is far better to be hard in outline than inaccurate. Subsequent touching up can smooth away the hardness, but there exists no proper material to work upon when there was carelessness in the first design. End of chapter 2 of English Men of Science Chapter 3, Part 1 Of the English Men of Science by Francis Galton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Leon Harvey Chapter 3 Origin of Taste for Science Preliminary, Extracts at Length, Analysis, Innate Tastes, Fortunate Accidents, Indirect Motives or Opportunities, Professional Duties, Encouragement at Home, Influence and Encouragement of Friends, Influence and Encouragement of Tutors, Travel in Distant Parts, Unclassed Residuum, Summary, Partial Failures. What were the motives that first induced the men on my list to occupy themselves with science? A question such as this may seem hard to answer, except in very general terms. Those who are but little versed in statistics may be daunted by reflecting on the infinite diversity of characters and antecedents, while those who are will be less easily discouraged. 
Reiterated experience will have shown them how surely, in every case with which they have dealt, the great majority of causes, or what might be better named pre-efficients, omitted of being analysed and grouped into natural orders, leaving a minority of unclassed influences, which themselves form a class of their own, and which can be reduced indefinitely, in proportion to the minuteness with which the statistician cares to pursue his analysis. The statistics of railway accidents will serve as an example. When Captain Douglas Galton was Secretary of the Railway Department of the Board of Trade, he succeeded in sorting their causes into the groups in which we have since been accustomed to see them printed year after year. So long as the general system of management of a railway is little changed, the same statistical ratio is maintained among them, a given proportion of accidents being due to this cause and another to that. We may therefore estimate, with some certainty, the saving of life and limb, or of material of various descriptions that will be effected when any one of these causes shall be wholly or in part removed. Similarly, my aim is to group the influences which first urged the men on my list to pursue what afterwards became their favourite occupation. We shall learn the relative importance of these influences and be enabled to estimate with greater precision than before the value of proposed methods for making the pursuit of science more common than at present. The returns I am about to quote are replies to the following questions. Can you trace the origin of your interest in science in general and in your particular branch of it? How far do your scientific tastes appear to have been innate? The answers were of unequal length and minuteness. From the longer ones I have extracted what was essential, and in these and in the rest I have taken a very few editorial liberties as already mentioned. At this stage of the inquiry it became advisable to separate the replies according to the branch of science pursued by those who made them. I have not kept geography separate, because there are not many geographers of my list, and those who were admitted of being sorted under other titles. With this exception, the divisions I have adopted are much the same as those of the various sections and subsections of the British Association. Some doubt may be felt as to how far the replies may be trusted. For my own part, I believe they are substantially correct, judging principally from internal evidence and partially from having questioned different members of several families and finding their opinions corroborative. The greatest difficulty I have had in my inquiries generally is due to reticence on the part of the writers who say nothing when much was to be said. But even this does not affect relative results. Again, many men are conceited, still the forms in which conceit shows itself do not much affect those results. Thus, a too emphatic narration of early achievements does not distort their mutual proportions. If men are too proud to acknowledge their indebtedness to natural gifts, the relative value may ascribe to motives remains unchanged. I am astonished at the unconscious vanity which I have elsewhere met with when making inquiries in hereditary, shown by men who, owing enormously to natural gifts, wish to accredit their own free will with being the real causes of their success. One phase of this form of vanity is prominently illustrated by the late John Stuart Mill, in his strange and sad autobiography, who declares, page 30, that he was rather below par in quickness, memory, and energy, and that any boy or girl of average capacity and healthy physical constitution who was properly taught could make a rapid progress in learning as he did himself. As regards the scientific men, I find, as I had expected, vanity to be at a minimum, and their returns to bear all the marks of a cool and careful self-analysis. My bias has always been in favour of men of science, believing them to be especially manly, honest, and truthful, and the results of this inquiry has confirmed that bias. The influences and motives which urge the men on my list to occupy themselves with science fall under their heads given below. I have distinguished each head by leisure, and added to each reply the letters that seemed appropriate to its contents. The replies have subsequently analysed according to these letters. Signification of the letters A. 59 instances. Innate tastes. M. Not necessarily hereditary. B. 11 instances. Fortunate accidents. It will be noted that these generally testify to the existence of an innate taste. C. 19 instances. Indirect opportunities and direct motives. D. 24 instances. Professional influences to exertion. E. 34 instances. 
encouragement at home of scientific inclinations f twenty instances influence and encouragement of private friends and acquaintances g thirteen instances influence and encouragement of teachers h eight instances travel in distant regions i three instances residual influences unclassed extracts at length physics one my tastes are entirely innate they date from childhood a two as far back as i can remember i loved nature and desired to learn her secrets my whole life in searching for them while a schoolboy i taught myself botany chemistry etc under great difficulties i had no teacher except a kind apothecary whose knowledge was limited a three from a youth i always preferred the man of marked ability to the man of action alone thrown for so many years of my professional life among men chiefly of the latter class and my sympathies being more drawn towards those in the decided minority my tastes were i conceive not acquired but innate in the early days of my professional career i gained the friendship of blank of the highest professional standing whose acquired general knowledge and love of science and observation were far beyond those of the ordinary blank of his time i was both his young friend and favourite assistant for three years he imbued me with his respect for science and formed my character for earnestness and accuracy to some extent my tastes were determined by events after manhood because in blank, extending over ten years i held positions of great responsibility in different parts of the world but i consider my scientific tastes were formed in youth that is from sixteen to twenty one years of age a f h four from an early age i was addicted to mechanical pursuits in the last few years of my school days i talked to chemistry entered blank college expecting after two or three years there to join a relative's business as calico printer and gave especial attention to chemistry on that account i have never attended specially to physics until appointed professor of natural philosophy this and subsequent similar advancement determined me to devote myself thenceforward definitely to physics and not to try for a chemical appointment a d five naturally fond of mechanics and of physical science in which all my study has taken the direction of those departments bearing on blank owing to my feeling that through the possession of special instruments for investigations in it i could work to greater advantage not from any natural preference for blank over the other departments of physical science a c six my tastes were partially natural partially encouraged by an eminent friend blank who had been honoured himself by the friendship of most of the leading men of science in the early part of this century a f seven yes i remember incidents which proved an innate taste quoted at length before i could write but i believe the origin of my pursuit of physical science was when i attended the natural philosophy class at blank i was intended for business but conceiving a distaste for it i left it and attached myself to science a g eight i cannot say except that i had an innate wish for miscellaneous information my interest in science arose from the chance circumstance of my choosing civil engineering as a profession and having spare time when studying at blank which i devoted to blank my scientific tastes were subsequently determined by my not having any profession except civil engineering which i never followed c nine ocean voyaging in beginning of life solitary observing for years in an observatory placed in a country verging on a desert but under southern skies rich in stars unknown to the ancients and not appreciated by the moderns d h ten the origin of my interest in science is mainly due to my father's knowledge of geology navigation and engineering my scientific tastes were confined by lectures by blank and blank and blank and especially by the encouragement of the latter e g eleven primarily derived both by inheritance and education from my father a e twelve my first start was reading a child's story called the ghost where a philosophical elder brother cures his younger brother of superstition by showing him experiments with phosphorus electricity etc this set me on making an electrical machine with an apothecary's file etc when i was about twelve years old my grandfather had scientific tastes to some degree my grandmother's brother 
blank, was a good amateur chemist and astronomer. He was a well-known leader of musical and to some extent of scientific society at blank. A. 13. A mathematical tendency, I think, led me first towards blank inquiry, to which I have been faithful ever since. Professional duties and civil engineering kept up a disposition to appreciate the material constituents of the world and led through surveying in the direction of physical geography. The distinct origin of my desire to place myself among scientific students was the wonderful impression produced on me by the aspect of nature as seen in the blank, combined with what I may call the accident of my having been allowed to explore a part of it in an official capacity. Having thus made rather large botanical and geological collections, I came to England with them, and while employed in arranging and distributing them, picked up a certain rather irregular and unsystematic scientific education in the company of blank and others. Forced back into professional life, special scientific inquiry has not been possible, but I have had opportunities of aiding the progress of science which I have endeavoured to make the best of. A. D. F. H. 14. Largely determined by my service in North Polar and Equatorial Expeditions. D. H. 15. I am not aware of any innate taste for science. I can only remember in boyhood the influence of the Philosophical Society of blank and of a juvenile philosophical society in which I took interest. My interest in astronomy, especially, was very small indeed, until I was appointed to the directorship of an observatory. D. Mathematical Subsection 16. I always regarded mathematics as the method of attaining the best shapes and dimensions of things, and this meant not only the most useful and economical, but chiefly the most harmonious and the most beautiful. I was taken to see blank, and so, with the help of Brewster's optics and a glazier's diamond, I worked at polarization of light, cutting crystals, tempering glass, etc. I should naturally have become an advocate by profession with scientific proclivities, but the existence of exclusively scientific men, and in particular of blank, convinced my father and myself that a profession was not necessary to a useful life. A. E. F. 17. My taste for mathematics appears innate. As a boy, I delighted in sums. I trace the origin of my interest in general science to my acquaintance with blank, which dates from the time when I was about 15 years of age. I taught myself in mathematics and chemistry during my apprenticeship to a civil engineer and land surveyor and subsequently studied blank abroad. My scientific tastes were largely developed through my first going to the continent with blank. A. F. 18. An early taste for arithmetic, and in particular for long division sums. A. 19. The following is an extract from biographical notes kindly communicated to me of the late Archibald Smith. Yachting would give an interest to all nautical matters, and the intimacy of his father with blank gave a bias towards magnetism. In a letter to one of his sisters, no date, about 1838, he says, blank, told me he was going to write directions for ships, finding and allowing for the error caused by the local attraction of ships. So, for my own amusement and partially to help him, I wrote a set of instructions and gave them to him. His mind was thus turned to the subject. I think it was natural to him to inquire into the reason of things. Font of figures when a boy. A, B, C, F. 20. My interest in mathematics began at blank university and was mainly due to the energy and encouragement of my tutor blank but professor blank first inspired me with the sense of the magnificence of mathematics g chemistry one thoroughly innate my first taste for chemistry dates from the possession of a chemical box when i was a little boy whenever i had a chance of turning from other studies to natural science i always turned i like to play better than all other work and in chemistry better than play a b 2. Perhaps wholly innate. My first notions of chemistry were picked up from books, and I got the nickname of experimentalizer at school. My taste for zoology arose through friendship with blank. My tastes were largely determined by three years' voluntary work at chemistry under Dr. Blank. A. F. 3. I was always observing and inquiring, and this disposition was never checked nor ridiculed in my childhood. My taste for chemistry dates from the lectures I attended as a boy, 
and to the permission to carry on little experiments at home in a room set apart for the purpose. I was encouraged in my tastes at home. Subsequent determining events were my residing abroad and my mother making a home for me there. A. B. E. 4. They date from a early period, and there was little to produce them in my early surroundings. As a small boy, I was fond of reading books bearing on natural science. I was taught at home with my brothers, and was partially self-taught also. We had always the example of industry, and were encouraged to think for ourselves. I first studied chemistry at blank college. A. E. 5. From an early age, I had an innate taste for all branches of natural science. As a boy, I made large collections of dried plants, minerals, beetles, butterflies, stuffed birds, etc. At blank, I studied without regard to future profession for two years. I only took up chemistry as a special study on my third year's residence there. A. C. 6. I cannot trace the origin. I began to study chemistry, estimating 18 and pursued it at such times as my duties in blank gave me leisure and without any instructor the obtaining of correct and accurate results in chemical analysis gave me great satisfaction c seven scarcely innate i ascribe the origin of my scientific interests chiefly to being sent as a pupil to an eminent man of science professor blank subsequently i was a good deal abstracted from scientific pursuits by an early and lasting friendship with Blank, who directed my thoughts to public work. G. 8. I watched at school the building of a steam engine at a factory, and completely got up the whole engine. This gave my mind a start. Blank, my father gave me Henry's chemistry. That, and afterwards Turner's chemistry, were more interesting to me than any books of fiction. I believe at one time I read little else but Turner's chemistry and books of poetry in whatever holiday I had. Blank. I owe to my mother a child's curiosity and afterwards a man's reverence for scientific truth. I cannot tell if my scientific tastes were innate. The university inviting me to fill the blank chair gave my work its bent. D. E. 9. I can trace my interest in chemistry to reading by accident a book upon it. B. 10. I did nothing, even quasi-scientific, till after leaving college, nothing serious till estimate... 23. My pursuit of chemistry is entirely due to circumstances occurring after manhood and in direct opposition to family influences. Z. 11. To the opportunity afforded for study of science at blank, my taste received no encouragement whatever from relations my mother accepted. E. Z. Geology. 1. Decidedly innate as regards coins and fossils. My father and an aunt collected coins and geological specimens, and I have both coins and specimens which have been in my possession since I was nine years old. Subsequently, my pursuits were influenced, to some extent, by the discoveries in blank, but at the time, I had already a considerable collection. A. C. E. 2. A natural taste for observing and generalising, developed by noticing the fossiliferous rocks which happened to occur in the neighbourhood of the school where I was. Afterwards, the surgeon to whom I was articled, who had an observant mind, fostered my tastes. A. B. F. 3. A natural taste. My interest in science began very early, originating in a love of experiment, at first in chemistry. The ultimate direction of my scientific taste dates after the completion of my regular education. A. C. 4. I believe I may say innate, to a very considerable extent not remembering that any definite steps were taken to inculcate science. I was indebted in a high degree to collections made by my father and mother in blank, and to an early familiarity with charts of those seas, and conversations on matters pertaining thereto. Afterwards, to going to Germany and finding in the mining officers a body of men receiving a regular scientific education. Lastly, to a great extent, by going for a winter to blank in Germany, and by conversations with blank and blank. A. E. F. 5. I was always fond of natural history, collecting plants, insects and birds at school and fossils at college, where blank lectures attracted me to geology and subsequently by the acquaintance of Professor blank to the particular branch of it which I have pursued. A. F. G. 6. 
As well as I can recollect, they were innate. I remember as a boy of six seeing a spring in Lavender Hill, not being satisfied at the explanation and determined to work it out for myself. I believe that I should have devoted myself to chemistry and physics, but that I was started as a youth of nineteen to travel ten months out of the twelve on business, and so continued for twenty years. This led to my visiting all Great Britain, and to great opportunities for geologizing, and determined me to that study. I worked hard at business all day, a very anxious business, and at evening and night would work hard at chemistry and geology. I found a wonderful relief in science. A.C. 7. I believe the desire for information and habits of observation to be in a great measure innate. They were first developed by a little elementary teaching in physics and chemistry at school, estimated 7 to 13. I worked alone at science at home from the age of 11 years when I was encouraged by the example of an elder brother. Subsequently, my pursuits were much influenced by being thrown at an early age, estimate 19, on my own judgment and resources. I founded a mining colony in the backwoods of blank and had it to carry out with several thousand people quite alone. A.E.H. 8. I was always apt to observe stones closely with regard to their qualities, but the scientific taste for geology was not developed till after manhood. Z. Biology. Zoological subsection. 1. Yes. Inherited from my father's family, who have generally been attached to natural history, especially botany. Most remarkable examples are given. My scientific tastes were largely determined by being appointed. A. D. E. 2. Certainly innate, strongly confirmed and directed by the voyage in the blank. A. H. 3. Love of observation and natural history innate. I had them as early as I can remember. My grandfather was very fond of natural history, and a more distant relative has written an excellent fauna of blank. The help of Mr. has aided me immensely, but not, I think, altered my tendency. A. E. F. 4. Homology innate, and derived from my mother. I trace the origin of my interest in science decidedly to my mother's observations in our childhood rambles on the plants and animals we saw. She told me that crabs were sea spiders and periwinkles, litterants, sea snails. I feel sure she had never read de Maillet. A. E. 5. I believe I inherited my general taste for scientific pursuits from my grandmother, but my choosing, blank, for special investigation resulted from a positive fascination which the very obscurity of the subject exerted upon my mind. It was perhaps a mere desire to unravel the marvellous. My scientific tastes were largely promoted by the attractive teaching of, blank, various professors. A. C. E. G. 6. Thoroughly innate. I had no regular instruction and can think of no event which especially helped to develop it. Bones and shells were attractive to me before I could consider them with any apparent profit, and books of natural history were my delight. I had a fair zoological collection by the time I was fifteen. My father had no scientific knowledge. Nevertheless, he encouraged me in all my tastes, giving me money freely for books and specimens against the advice of friends. But he was indulgent generally, and not in the scientific direction only. A. E. 7. Innate, as far as a love of nature and of the observation of natural phenomena. I trace the origin of my interest in science to the love of truth and of mental cultivation of my father, and his encouragement of this love in his children. I do not think it was largely determined by events after manhood. A. E. 8. I should say innate. I caught all my scraps of lessons for self-improvement. My soon developed enthusiasm must have been derived from my mother's family. As to whether they were largely developed by events occurring after manhood, I think not. All I can say is that neither profession nor marriage nor sickness has been able to affect them. A. E. 9. I cannot recollect the time when I was not fond of animals, and of knowing all I could learn about them. Living in the country, I had abundant opportunities for indulging my taste, though, of course, I was not allowed to keep half the number of pets I should have liked. The example of my father and elder brothers, who were all pretty firm to field sports, was also followed by me, and from field sports to field natural history is but a step. I obtained by a piece of sheer good luck the travelling fellowship of blank. It was tenable for nine years, and its income was sufficient to keep me during that time without being obliged to enter any profession. 
Those circumstances subsequently interfered with my using this assistance to the most advantage. In gratifying my taste for natural history, it was enormously furthered thereby. A, B, C, E. 10. My partiality for the natural history sciences was initiated partially by my selection of medicine as a profession, and perhaps even more of that, during the period of my apprenticeship, I was much under the influence of a remarkable man, blank, a most accomplished naturalist, and of singularly independent judgment, blank. For three years I spent every Sunday morning with him. During this time he was constantly stimulating me, a willing follower, to work in his department of natural sciences, and at the same time ever inculcating a spirit of scientific scepticism. D.F. 11. To love of birds, their study, their dissection, I remember trying to find out, in the structure of the oviduct, the cause of colour and markings in the different eggs. I discovered hairs sticking in the cuckoo's stomach, arranged in a spiral manner. Before I knew that, John Hunter had described the same. Then I talked to drawing skulls and skeletons, and my fate was sealed. That I inherited a strong love of nature is certain, from my father, who was devoted to horticulture and very fond of birds and of landscape scenery. But I cannot trace any direct tendencies or work on the part of any member of my family except my brother. I feel that I must have had a taste of a science independently of external circumstances. At the age of 17 or 18, I had dissected every new kind of bird that I met with. Later opportunities were entirely made by myself, or perhaps rather taken advantage of by myself. A. E. 12. My love of natural history, so common in boys, showed itself in collecting insects, shells, and birds' eggs, and delighting in reading such books as Stanley on birds, whites, Selborne, Waterton, etc., at a very early age, eight years or before, and, being rather encouraged than checked, continued to grow till it developed into a fondness for anatomical pursuits generally, which was never abandoned. My taste for science was entirely innate. No other member of the family, nor early friend or acquaintance, had any special taste for any of the natural history sciences. Two brothers of nearly the same age, and with precisely the same surroundings, though joining occasionally in, in some of the above-mentioned boyish pursuits, never pursued them with real interest, and soon entirely gave them up. A. E. 13. As a boy, I had no taste for natural history, but a passion for mechanical controversies, physics and chemistry. I earnestly desired to be an engineer by the fact that I had a blank, near relative, a medical man, led to my being apprenticed to him, and I took to physiology and anatomy as the engineering side of my profession. The inclinations above mentioned were altogether innate, and so far as I know, not hereditary, neither of my parents nor any of the family showing any trace of the like tendencies. My appointment to the surveying ship, blank, made me a comparative anatomist by affording opportunities for the investigation of the structure of the lower animals. My appointment to blank forced me to paleontology. A. C. D. H. 14. My school nickname was Archimedes. I was always fond of construction. If I had followed my own bent, I should probably have been successful as an engineer. My turn for scientific inquiry led me in early life to systematize the knowledge of others. Literally, I have felt more interest in original investigations. A.C. 15. I was in a general atmosphere of scientific thinking and discipline. My taste for biology began with keeping insects, for chemistry and physics by being led to try experiments, largely inherited from my father. I have made my circumstances more than they have made me. A.C.E. 16. My father's example influenced me so early that I have no means of judging, but I doubt much their innate character. Their origin was due primarily, beyond all probability of doubt, to my father's influence and example. They were not influenced by subsequent events, but the tastes once planted rather determined the events. My medical profession caused me to suspend my scientific pursuits for some years, but the accidental pursual of blank brought me back again to the study of the blank, and all the rest followed in due time. B. E. 17. They appear to have been inherited. My interest in science arose from the example of my father and the fact of my being for a year the assistant and a close companion of Professor Blank of Blank, at whose side I visited the poor in the lanes of Blank, day and night. First began to work and concentrate energies to one branch, estimate 21, when appointed. A. D. E. G. 
18. They have been, I believe, nearly in an equal degree the mixed result of a natural bias in education, and were determined by a professional study when a love of scientific knowledge for its own sake first took possession of my mind. A. D. 19. How far innate and how far acquired and developed from my early youth I cannot say. My love for animals of all kinds was very strong, and to gratify it I overcame every obstacle put in my way at home when I was a boy. I trace the origin of my interest in science to the earliest impressions of my childhood, all of which, as far as I recollect them, are connected with my father, and the various animals he brought me as pets. They were not largely determined by events after manhood. I should have been an observer of animal life under any conditions under which I might have lived. A. E. 20. I cannot trace the origin of my interest in geology. I believe it to have been innate. I began collecting birds and studying them before I went to school and without any inducement. I was always told by my relations that my scientific pursuits would stand in my way, but adhered to them notwithstanding. They were not at all determined by events occurring after I reached manhood. They simply increased as I grew older. A. 21. I perceive no evidence of their being innate, hereditary, unless I derived any tendency from my mother, who was at the time much with her great uncle, blank, the founder of one of our great industries, and greatly interested in his pursuits. She worked a good deal at chemistry, and was well acquainted with many of the processes in pottery. I belonged to an industrious family, and saw everyone working. The attraction I have for chemistry, which is a strong one, only my profession has never allowed me to follow it very closely, arose from being sent to work, estimate, 15, in a chemical laboratory. E. 22. I do not consider them innate, but induced by the following circumstances. When I was at school, estimate 13 to 15, a lady, an old friend of my mother, gave me a few British shells with their names and a copy of Turton's Conchological Dictionary. I thenceforth diligently collected British shells and afterwards extended my researches. B. 23. To my father's example in science, to the profession of medicine in physiology, anatomy, and blank, it was my interest in my profession to work at scientific subjects while young and while waiting for practice. The example of many men whom I knew when young proved a great stimulus and incentive. E. D. F. 24. Not at all innate. I can trace it directly to my intercourse with certain professors, blank, subsequently to my desire to investigate certain scientific questions bearing on medicine, and later to my intercourse with blank and blank. C. D. F. G. Biology. Botanical subsection. 1. My scientific tastes were inborn and strongly hereditary. A. 2. As far as the word applies to any case, I should say innate. Accepting such influences as a little encouragement at home, I am unable to trace any external stimulus. At estimating 6, I was given Joyce's scientific dialogues, which I soon mastered, then other books. Before estimating 8, I commenced making star maps. Estimating 12 to 13, I made some geological sections with tolerable correctness and so on. It then seemed as if by accident and the love of new vistas were enough to lead me from one branch of science to another. A. 3. Always fond of plants. A. 4. Was always fond of objective and experimental knowledge. I date my first efforts of any consequence from an early intimacy with Professor blank, whose pupil and assistant I was. I had a fondness for science before, but the necessity for accurate and rigid observation then first dawned upon me. Subsequent events were going to blank, abroad, and appointments in blank, a foreign country where I was much detained indoors that compelled me to take to the microscope and study of the lower orders of plants and animals, many of which I could grow in my own room. A. C. G. 5. As a youth I followed of my own free will mineralogy, chemistry, anatomy, and mechanics, but chiefly chemistry. My tastes were certainly not hereditary. They were directed to botany purely through accidental circumstances, which led to a prolonged residence in an imperfectly civilized country. I examined its plants, then wholly unknown to Europeans, but was at that time wholly ignorant of the very elements of botany, was subsequently encouraged by blank, eminent botanists of the day, went to and from England and made extensive collections. My wife actively assisted me in my botanical and other scientific pursuits, and to her advice, and assistance I owe much of my success in life. A. F. H. 
6. The love for botany was instilled into me in very early youth by my father. We lived in the house of blank, a very eminent geologist, in the vicinity of blank, and I often took walks to those hills and collected plants. We also cultivated plants in our garden. A taste for natural science, especially botany, seems to have been innate. The companionship of blank incited me to prosecute botany with vigour. I was one of his best pupils and travelled over a great part of blank with him, e.g. 7. A posthumous account. He appears to have been attached to natural history all his life through, but never took up botany to any extent till the professorship was vacant. There is some conflict of testimony here. I think his scientific tastes were innate. I have excellent drawings of insects made by him as a schoolboy. Also, he made a model of a caterpillar, tried a little chemistry, made lace with bobbins of his own contriving. It was said nothing escapes that boy's eyes. A.D. 8. To my father's encouragement of a natural inclination. A.E. 9. I cannot trace the origin of my interest in any particular branch of science further than that as far as regards blank botany. I was thrown into the society of a gentleman who took much interest in it. My scientific taste originated, as a matter of fact, after leaving blank the university. F. 10. Not innate. I trace the origin of my botanical taste to leisure, to the accidental receipt of de Candolle's Flore Francaise, whilst resident in that country, and to encouragement from my mother. They were determined afterwards by independence, considering my absence of ambition to rise in the world, and by friendship and encouragement from blank. The four greatest British botanists of the day. B. E. F. Biology. Medical Subsection. 1. Innate in a great degree. I trace the origin of my interest in science, 1. To my mother's mental activity and love of collecting and arranging, and my father's constant encouragement of my pursuit. 2. To a friendship of three eminent botanists, by whom I was chiefly induced to study botany. 3. To my profession, the choice of which was, in some measure, determined by my taste for collecting and studying. A. D. E. F. 2. I selected the medical profession because it was that of my father. This choice led me to scientific pursuits, for which I had no previous predilection, as I had no opportunities that way. I conclude the tastes were innate, as they certainly showed themselves the moment the opportunity for developing them occurred, namely, at the commencement of my professional studies. Estimate 17. A.D. 3. Not at all especially innate. I could have taken to any other subject quite as well, so far as I know. I trace the origin of my interest in science to the knowledge that I must do my best in it to earn a livelihood and to please my parents. I did not follow my own branch from any special liking, indeed I disliked it, but it was necessary to follow some branch. The connection with the hospital and medical school in blank have been inducements to continue work, and all my life I have worked pretty steadily. D. 4. I cannot perceive that they were innate. Possibly my tastes were due to a retentiveness of memory as to objects and facts, and a strong impression that good surgery is a great fact. Subsequently, by the approval of teachers, when, between estimated 18 and 20, having been selected chief assistant to the most popular teacher of anatomy of his day, and also to a professor of surgery, C.G. 5. Had an interest excited in philosophical inquiries by my father's acute observations in all such topics. E. 6. I cannot say that I had naturally a turn for any pursuit in particular. My addiction to medicine was purely the result of accident. I never gave a thought to physics as a subject of study until I was 27 years old. D. 7. Accidentally directed to medicine by associating with a medical friend in a superficial study of botany. C. D. Statistics. 1. Certainly my scientific tastes appear to me to have been so to say, innate. A. 2. My interest in science was due to my having been officially employed in an early part of my career in a very important statistical inquiry. D. 3. Innate, I think. I inherited many mental peculiarities and talents from my paternal grandfather, amongst which is a love of figures and tabulation, none from my father. I cannot otherwise trace the origin of my interest in science, nor were my tastes largely determined by events after manhood. A. 4. 
I should be much inclined to think there was an innate tendency, but that the tastes were developed by a good and, for the most part, suitable education. When at my first school, estimating ten and a half to twelve, the headmaster gave very clear occasional lessons in moral and economical subjects. I can remember vividly to the present day the impression which those lessons made upon me, as I am not aware that the other boys in the class were equally impressed. I think I must have had an innate interest in those subjects, but the lessons probably increased the interest very much. A. B. G. 5. I cannot distinguish between what I may have derived from nature and what I may have acquired from intercourse with my father and certain of his friends. When I was eleven years old, my father gave a series of lectures on electricity, mechanics, astronomy, and pneumatics, to all of which, but especially to the last, I paid delightful attention. I presently began to construct apparatus for myself. Subsequently, practice in teaching led me to seek for knowledge. Intercourse with men of higher attainments became a great spur. My turn for blank was favoured by my opportunities as an early member of the blank society. A. E. F. 6. Professor Blank's lectures on geology were the origin of my interest in that science. The work of his blank statistical society in educational inquiries influenced my taste for statistical science. Frequent attendance at meetings of the British Association encouraged my scientific tastes. D. G. Mechanical Science 1. If any tastes be innate, mine were, they date from beyond my recollection. They were not determined by events after manhood, but I think the reverse. They were discouraged in every way. A. 2. Decidedly innate. The science of blank was well taught at the University of blank, where I studied, estimated 16 to 18, and accidentally this became serviceable to me when employed as an engineer by blank. The friendship of blank materially affected my career. My tastes were not largely developed by events occurring after manhood. ABDF. 3. Family tradition derived through my mother's side. My profession fell in with my natural tastes, such as sketching. CDE. 4. Innate. I think as regards certain qualities of mind, which led me, under the pressure of circumstances, to direct my attention to certain things in a certain way. Namely, 1. Independence of judgment. 2. Earnestness of purpose. 3. A practical, clear-headed, common-sense, logical way of viewing things. C.D. 5. I cannot say whether they were innate. I was always brought up in a half-scientific, half-literary atmosphere, and was a fair mathematician as a boy, as well as a fair classic and linguist. My tastes were not determined by after-events, but my avocations were rather determined by my scientific habits. E. End of chapter 3, part 1. Chapter 3, Part 2 of English Men of Science by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Origin and Taste for Science, Part 2. Analysis of Replies. Having given the replies in gross, now becomes our business to sort their contents under different heads. It would be useless and even embarrassing to make lengthy extracts from them. Short abstracts will therefore be given, which the reader may verify whenever he pleases by the help of the reference number printed in parenthesis, which is in the same both here and in the original. A. Innate Tastes Instances of a strong taste for scientific being decidedly innate. I have not included among these the whole of the cases to which an A has been affixed. Physics and Mathematics, 12 cases out of 20 replies. 1. My tastes are entirely innate. They date from childhood. 2. As far back as I can remember. I love nature and desire to learn her secrets. 3. Always attracted by men of ability. 4. From an early age, I was addicted to mechanical pursuits, then to chemistry. 5. Naturally fond of mechanics and physical science. 6. My tastes were partially natural, partially encouraged. 7. I remember incidents which proved an innate taste before I could write. 8. I had an innate wish for miscellaneous information. 11. Primarily derived both by inheritance and education from my father. 
16. I always regarded mathematics as the method of obtaining both the most useful and the most harmonious, etc. 17. My taste for mathematics appears innate. As a boy, I delighted in sums. 18. An early taste for arithmetic, and in particular, for long division sums. Chemistry. Five cases out of eleven. One, thoroughly innate. Two, perhaps wholly innate. Three, I was always observing and inquiring. Four, they date from a very early period, and there was little to produce them in my early surroundings. Five, from an early age, I had an innate taste for all branches of science. Geology. At least seven out of eight cases. One, decidedly innate. Two, a natural taste for observing and generalizing developed. Three, a natural taste. My interest in science began very early. Four, I believe I may say innate, but to a very considerable extent. Five, I was always fond of natural history. Six, as well as I can recollect, they were innate. Seven, I believe the desire for information and habits of observation to be in great measure innate. Zoology, 18 cases out of 24. 1. Yes, inherited from my father's family. 2. Certainly innate. 3. Love of observation and natural history innate. 4. Homology innate. 5. I believe I inherited my general taste for scientific pursuits. 6. Thoroughly innate. Bones and shells were attractive to me before I could consider them with any apparent profit. 7. Innate love of nature and observation of natural phenomena. 8. I should say innate. I caught at all scraps of lessons for self-improvement. 9. I cannot recollect the time when I was not fond of animals and of knowing all I could learn about them. 11. Love of birds and their study. I feel that I must have had a taste for science independently of external circumstances. 12. My taste for science was entirely innate. 13. As a boy, I had a passion for mechanical contrivances. My scientific tastes are altogether innate. 14. I was always fond of construction. My turn for scientific inquiry led me in early life to systematize the knowledge of others. 15. Largely inherited from my father. 17. They appear to have been inherited. 18. Nearly in an equal degree the mixed result of a natural bias in education. 19. I should have been an observer of animal life under whatever conditions I might have lived. 20. I believe my interest in zoology to have been innate. Botany. Eight cases out of ten. One, my scientific tastes were inborn. Two, as far as the word applies in any case, I should say decidedly innate. Three, always fond of plants. Four, was always fond of objective and experimental knowledge. Five, as a youth I followed of my own free will chemistry and other sciences. Six, a taste for natural science, especially botany, seems to have been innate. Seven, scientific tastes apparently innate. Eight, a natural inclination. Medical science. Only two cases out of seven. One. Innate in a great degree. Two. I conclude the tastes were innate as they showed themselves the moment the opportunity for developing them occurred. Statistics. Three cases out of six. One. Certainly my scientific tastes appear to me to have been, so to say, innate. Three. Innate, I think. Four. Much inclined to think there was an innate tendency. Mechanical science, at least two cases out of five. One, if any tastes be innate, mine were. They date from beyond my recollection. Two, decidedly innate. Instances of tastes being decidedly not innate. Physics and mathematics, one case out of twenty. Fifteen, I am not aware of any innate taste for science. Chemistry, one case out of eleven. Ten, I did nothing serious until, estimate, 23. My pursuit of chemistry is entirely due to circumstances occurring after manhood. Zoology, three cases out of 24. 16. I doubt much their innate character. 22. I do not consider them innate, but induced. 24. Not at all innate. Botany, one case out of 10. 10. Not innate. Medical, four cases out of seven. 3. Not at all especially innate. 4. I cannot perceive that they were innate. 6. I cannot say that I had naturally a turn for any pursuit in particular. 7. Accidentally directed to medicine. Statistics. 1. At most out of 6. 2. My interest in science was due to my having been officially employed in a statistical inquiry. 
it is with much hesitation that I consent to enter this as a case of not innate. A table is displayed on the page, summary of results as to innate tastes. There are four columns with total cases, decidedly innate, decidedly not innate, and doubtful, a total down the bottom. On the far left, reads as physics and mathematics, chemistry and mineralogy, geology, biology, with subsections of zoology, botany, medical science. Geography, not discussed separately, statistical science, and mechanical science. Physics and mathematics, total cases, 20. Decidedly innate, 12. Decidedly not innate, 1. Doubtful, 7. Chemistry and mineralogy, total cases, 11. Decidedly innate, 5. Decidedly not innate, 1. Doubtful, 5. Geology, total cases, 8. Decidedly innate, 7. Decidedly not innate, 5. Zero. Doubtful. One. Biology. Zoology. Total cases. 24. Decidedly innate. 17. Decidedly not innate. 3. Doubtful. Four. Botany. Total cases. 10. Decidedly innate. 8. Decidedly not innate. 1. Doubtful. One. Medical science. Total cases. 7. Decidedly innate. 2. Decidedly not innate. 4. Doubtful, 1. Geography, not discussed separately. Total cases, 0. Decidedly, innate, 0. Decidedly, not innate, 0. Doubtful, 0. Statistical science. Total cases, 6. Decidedly, innate, 3. Decidedly, not innate, 1. Doubtful, 2. Mechanical science. Total cases, 5. Decidedly, innate, 2. Decidedly, not innate, 0. Doubtful, 3. Total cases total, 91. Decidedly innate total, 56. Decidedly not innate total, 11. Doubtful, total, 24. A mere glance at the table and at the foregoing extracts will probably be enough to convince the reader that a strong and innate taste for science is a prevailing characteristic among scientific men. Also that the taste is enduring. This latter peculiarity is by no means a necessary consequence of the former. On the contrary, the ruling motives in the dispositions of a man usually change as he grows older, the love of inquiring in childhood being superseded by the fierce passions of youth and these by the ambitions of more mature life. But a special taste for science seems frequently to be so ingrained in the constitution of scientific men that it asserts itself throughout their whole existence. Obviously, it must have had great influence in directing their early studies and in ensuring their successful prosecution of them in after years. It would be a curious inquiry to seek the limits of a special taste, that is, the diversity of the objects, any one of which would satisfy it. I think the indications are clear that the tastes of some of my correspondents are far more special than those of others, and that the latter have checked a tendency to desultoriness by their strength of will, or have had it checked by the necessities of their position as professors or professional men, or at most of all by their possession of that strange quality which the phrenologists call adhesivists, but which seem to defy analysis. It exists in very different strength in different persons, and I know not where to find a better illustration of its power than in the ordinary case of a man falling in love for the first time. Few lookers-on will doubt that almost any young man is capable of falling in love with any one of at least one-third of the presentable young women of his race and social position, if they happen to see much of one another under favourable circumstances and without other distraction. Yet although the innate taste is of so general a character, it becomes specialised at once by the mere act of falling in love. Then the image of one woman takes complete possession of his thoughts. She is for a considerable period the only female who has attractions for him, although he may previously have had equally attracted by any one of tens of thousands of her sex. A strong taste bearing remotely on science may prove very helpful. The love of collecting, which is a trifling tendency in itself, common to children, idiots and magpies, often leads to the study of the things collected, and is of immense use to a man who wishes to study objects that must be collected in large numbers. I have been told of an astronomer whose primary taste was a love of polished brass instruments and smooth mechanical movements, that nothing satisfied this taste so fully as work with telescopes, and from loving the instruments he soon learnt to love the work for which they were used. A taste for careful drawing works well into engineering and into systematic botany or zoology. 
a love of adventure and field sports may be an extremely useful element in the character of a man who follows geology or zoology as a rough numerical estimate it seems that six out of every ten men of science were gifted by nature with a strong taste for it certainly not one person in ten taken at haphazard possesses such an instinct therefore i contend that its presence adds fivefold at least to the chance of scientific success the converse way of looking at the question gives a similarly large estimate certainly one half of the population have no care for science and an extremely small population of that half succeed in it nay further it appears though i cannot publish facts in evidence without violating my rule of avoiding personal illusions that of the men who have no natural taste for science and yet succeed in it may belong to gifted families and may therefore be accredited with sufficient general abilities to leave their mark on whatever subject it becomes their business to undertake we may therefore rest assured that the possession of a strong special taste is a precious capital and that it is a wicked waste of natural power to thwart it ruthlessly by a false system of education but i can give no test which shall distinguish in boyhood between a taste that is destined to endure and a passing fancy further than by remarking that whenever the aptitudes seem hereditary they deserve peculiar consideration instinctive tastes for science are generally speaking not so strongly hereditary as the more elementary qualities of the body and mind i have tabulated the replies and find the proportion to be one case of inheritance to four that are not inherited from either parent there is no case in which the correspondent speaks of having inherited a love of science from his mother though of course she may and probably has often transmitted it from a grandparent i have a curious case among the returns sent to me of a passion for heraldry characterizing a great nephew and a great uncle the latter of whom have died before the former was born i have another of an eminent statistician in whom a love of figures and tabulation was highly characteristic of his grandparent and is very strongly marked in himself but was wholly absent in his parent and all other known members of his small family there have been numerous and most curious cases of a love of figures and tabulation in my own family which richly deserve a full description it was carried to so strange an extravagance by one of its members a lady now deceased that i can do no sufficient justice to her peculiarities by speaking in general terms i ought to give pages of anecdote b fortunate accidents we next come to a group of cases which imply a latent taste for science namely where a lifelong pursuit of it was first determined by some small accident the previous indifference or equilibrium of the mind was unstable a push was accidentally given its position was wholly changed and it rested in one of stable equilibrium these cases are not numerous only ten altogether but i put them in the second place on account of their affinity to those in the first physics and mathematics nineteen refer to this chemistry one possession of a chemical box when i was a little boy three from lectures i attended when a boy nine to reading by accident a book on chemistry geology two fossiliferous rocks near the school where i was zoology nine a travelling fellowship sixteen accidentally reading a book brought me back to scientific studies previously suspended owing to my profession 22. Gift, when a boy, of a box of British shells, with a book to explain them. Botany, 10. Accidental receipt of de Candolle's Flore Francaise, when residing in France. Medical science, none. Statistics, 4. Very clear occasional lectures, when a boy. Mechanics, 2. A particular study at a university, which accidentally became of professional importance. C indirect motives or opportunities this group has also considerable affinity to group a and has been alluded to in the remarks appended to the extracts referring to it it includes those cases in which the mind was partially but not largely deflected from its natural bent that portion of the innate tendency which admitted of being resolved in the direction of the scientific pursuit being satisfied the remainder being wasted these cases are not numerous only sixteen altogether but i give them the third place for the same reason that i give group b the second physics and mathematics five possession of special instruments eight choosing engineering as a profession but not following it nineteen love of yachting leading to researches on magnetism of ships chemistry six 
The obtaining of correct and accurate results in chemical analysis gave me great satisfaction. Geology 1. Interest in discoveries made in blank. 3. A very early love of experiment in chemistry. 6. Should have followed chemistry and physics, but circumstances blank gave opportunities for geology. Zoology 5. My choosing blank for special investigation was due to a positive fascination from the obscurity of the subject. 9. My father's and brother's pursuit of field sports, and thence indirectly to natural history. 13. An early passion for mechanism, which led me to take to physiology and anatomy as the engineering side of my profession. 15. My taste for biology began with keeping insects. 24. Blank. Subsequently to the desire to investigate certain questions bearing on medicine. Botany. None. Medical Science. 3. Connection of hospital and medical school with the place of his residence. 4. Love of facts and the impression that good surgery is a great fact. Statistics. None. Mechanics. 3. Profession fell in with natural tastes, such as sketching. 4. Innate faculties serviceable to profession under the pressure of circumstances. D. Professional duties. The fourth group compromises instances in which professional duty was a principal cause of the interest first felt in scientific pursuits, or else of the energies being concentrated upon some branch of science towards special inclination had previously been exhibited. Two or three of the twenty-one cases which I shall quote may perhaps be thought doubtful examples and more appropriate to the preceding group, but after all possible deductions have been made, there will remain ample evidence of the magnitude of the influence we are considering. A wise administrator, desirous, even at some cost, of promoting original investigation, would establish many professional offices of a scientific character, having responsible duties of a prominent kind attached to them. They would create much new interest in science, and would compel those who held them to work steadily and to a purpose in scientific harness. Physics and Mathematics, 4. Had never attended specially to physics till appointed Professor of Natural Philosophy, this induced me to give up chemistry and to devote myself definitively to physics. 9. Solitary observing for years as director of an observatory. 13. Professional duties in civil engineering. Blank. Official exploration of. Blank. 14. Largely determined by service in North Polar and Equatorial expeditions. 15. My interest in astronomy was very small indeed until I was appointed to the directorship of an observatory. Chemistry. 8. The university invited me to fill the chair of blank, gave my work its bent, geology none, zoology one, largely determined by being appointed blank, ten, partially by my selection of medicine as a profession, thirteen, my appointment to a surveying ship made me a comparative anatomist blank, that too blank, forced me to paleontology, seventeen, first began to concentrate energies to one branch when appointed blank. 18. My scientific tastes were determined by professional study. 23. To the profession of medicine, in physiology, anatomy, and blank. 24. Subsequently to my desire to investigate certain subjects bearing on my profession of medicine. Botany. 7. Never took up botany to any extent till the professorship was vacant. There is some conflict of testimony here. Medical Science. 1. Partially to my profession. 2. I selected the medical profession because it was that of my father. This choice led me to scientific pursuits. 3. I did not follow my own branch from any special liking. Indeed, I rather disliked it. But it was necessary to earn a livelihood and to follow some branch. 6. My addiction to medicine was purely the result of accident. I never gave a thought to physics as a subject of study until I was 27 years old. 7. Accidental to medicine. Statistics 2. Due to official employment when young, in a very important statistical inquiry. Mechanics 2. The science of blank, which I learnt accidentally, became serviceable to me when employed as an engineer. 3. My profession fell in with my natural tastes. 4. Pressure of circumstances. E. Encouragement at home. Nearly one-third of the scientific men have expressed themselves indebted to encouragement at home. They received it in various ways. Sometimes the influence of the parent was strong, and as their origin was due beyond all doubt to my father's influence. Sometimes it was strong but general as, I was in a general atmosphere of scientific thinking and discussion. 
Sometimes it went no further than indulgence, as permission to carry on little experiments at home in a room set apart for the purpose. Under each and all of these shapes, it was truly welcome, and its effectiveness may be in some measure estimated by the vastly smaller number of cases in which success was obtained in direct opposition to family influences. Scientific studies in boyhood are apt to meet with scant favour at home. They deal too much in abstractions on the one hand, and sensible messes and mischief to furniture and clothes on the other. They lead to no clearly lucrative purpose, and occupy time which might be apparently better bestowed. These hindrances were far more seriously felt when the men on my list were young, when apparatus was hardly to be procured, and when scientific work was exceptional. I ascribe many of the cases of encouragement to the existence of an hereditary link, that is to say, the son had inherited scientific tastes, and was encouraged by the parent from whom he had inherited them, and who naturally sympathised with him. Attention should be given to the relatively small encouragement received from the mother. I have sorted the extracts so as to permit the comparison to be easily made. The female mind has special excellencies of a high order, and the value of its influence in various ways is one that I can never consent to underrate, but that influence is towards enthusiasm and love, as distinguished from philanthropy, not towards calm judgment, nor inclusively towards science. In many respects, the character of scientific men is strongly anti-feminine. Their mind is directed to facts and abstract theories, and not to persons or human interests. The man of science is deficient in the purely emotional element, and in the desire to influence the beliefs of others. Thus I find that two out of every ten do not care for politics at all. They are devoid of partisanship. They school a naturally equable and independent mind to a still more complete subordination to their judgment. In many respects they have little sympathy with female ways of thought. It is a curious proof of this that, in the very numerous answers which have reference to parental influence, that of the father is quoted three times as often as that of the mother. It would not have been the case, judging from inquiries I elsewhere made, if I had been discussing the antecedents of literary men, commanders or statesmen, or still more of divines. Physics and Mathematics 10 the origin of my interest in blank is mainly due to my father's knowledge of geology, navigation, and engineering. 11. Primarily derived both by education and inheritance from my father. Chemistry. 3. Permission to carry on little experiments at home, in a room set apart for the purpose. Blank. Subsequently residing abroad, and my mother making a home for me there. 4. I was taught at home with my brothers. We had always the example of industry, and were encouraged to think for ourselves. 8. My father gave me some books on chemistry, and I owe to my mother a child's curiosity, and afterward a man's reverence for scientific truth. 11. My taste received no encouragement whatever from relations. My mother accepted. Geology. 1. My father and aunt collected specimens. 4. I was indebted to a high degree to collections made by my father and mother. 7. I was encouraged by the example of an elder brother. Zoology 9. The example of my father and elder brothers, who were all pretty firm to field sports, was also followed by me, and from field sports to field natural history is but a step. 15. I inherited from my father. I was in a general atmosphere of scientific thinking and discussion. 21. I may have derived, inherited, the tendency from my mother. I belonged to an industrious family and saw everyone working. 1. Traditionally derived, and inherited from my father's family, i.e. from father, grandfather, etc. 6. My father had no scientific knowledge, nevertheless he encouraged me. 7. I trace it to the love of truth and of mental cultivation in my father, and to his encouragement of this love in his children. 11. That I inherited a strong love of nature from my father is certain, who was devoted to horticulture and very fond of birds. 16. Their origin was due, beyond all doubt, to my father's influence. 17. My interest in science arose from the example of my father and... blank, etc. 19. I trace it to the earliest impressions of my childhood, all of which are connected with my father and the animals he brought me as pets. 23. To my father's example in science. 4. Decidedly to my mother's observations in our childhood rambles. 8. My soon developed enthusiasm must have been derived from my mother's family. Botany. 
2. A little encouragement at home. 6. The love of botany was instilled into me in very early youth by my father. 8. To my father's encouragement of a natural inclination. 10. And to encouragement from my mother. Medical Science 1. Partially to my mother's mental activity and love of collecting and arranging, and to my father's constant encouragement of my pursuit. Statistics 5. Partially acquired from intercourse with my father and blank. Mechanics 5. I was always brought up in a half scientific, half literary atmosphere. 3. Family tradition derived through my mother's side. Two cases are mentioned in which the origin of the scientific tastes was partly due to the active assistance of the wife. One of these is botany, and the other I have ventured to suppress, as it did not appear to me sufficiently decided. F. The Influence and Encouragement of Friends This group has much in common with that of the indirect influences already classed under Group C. It includes cases where a fortuitous acquaintance has been the means of deciding, probably by revealing a later taste or showing how some obstacle in the way of indulging it could easily be removed. There is a wide interval, often very difficult to get over, between the study of a subject out of books and the practical investigation of it for oneself. At this point of a man's mental progress, the help of a friend may be of immense assistance. He may give elementary hints which will remove formidable difficulties to a beginner who is utterly unused to experiment. It is told, I think, of a scholar that he laboured for successive days to make with his own hands in his own chambers a plum pudding according to a time-honoured family recipe, but he produced nothing except thick pastes or stirabouts of different degrees of lumpiness revolting to the sight. At length he confided his difficulties to a lady who explained that in making plum puddings it was a matter of course and therefore not spoken of in the recipe, to put the ingredients into a bag before beginning to boil them. The example of a friend encourages a young man to overcome his diffidence and to firmly occupy any position that he knows by his own judgment to be true. Perhaps the greatest help of all is the consciousness of strength, which is given by cooperation on not very unequal terms with a veteran in performance and reputation. Out of the 91 cases, 18 speak gratefully of the influence and encouragement of friends. Physics and Mathematics 3. I was both his young friend and assistant for three years. He imbued me with his respect for science. Blank. Earnestness and accuracy. 6. Partially encouraged by an eminent friend. 13. Picked up an unsystematic education in science in the company of blank. 16. I was taken to see blank, which was the origin of my experimentalizing. 17. I trace it to my acquaintance with blank, and to going abroad with him. 19. The intimacy of his father with blank gave me a bias towards magnetism. Chemistry. 2. My taste for zoology arose through friendship with blank. Geology. 2. The surgeon to whom I was articled fostered my tastes. 4. To mining offices in Germany, to conversations with blank and blank, and acquaintance of blank. 5. Through the acquaintance of blank, to the particular branch of geology that I have pursued. Zoology 3. The help of blank has aided me immensely. 10. I was much under the influence of a remarkable man, a most accomplished naturalist. 23. The example of many men whom I knew when I was young proved great stimulus and incentive. I can trace it distinctly to my intercourse with certain professors. Botany 5. Blank was subsequently encouraged by eminent botanists. 9. I was thrown into the society of a gentleman who took much interest in botany. 10. They were determined afterwards by blank, and the friendship and encouragement of the four greatest British botanists of the day. Medical Science 1. Partially to the friendship of three eminent botanists. 7. Accidentally directed to medicine by associating with a medical friend in a superficial study of botany. Statistics. 5. Partially from intercourse with my father and certain of his friends. Mechanical science. 2. The friendship of blank materially influenced my career. G. Influence and encouragement of tutors. This group of 13 cases refers to the influence and encouragement of masters, tutors and professors. It is a small one, 
not because persons in those positions are incapable of exerting much salutary influence but because the scientific men on my list seldom had the advantage of receiving congenial instruction this is clearly proved by a comparison of the replies referring to scotch and to english tuition in scotland the university program and the general method of teaching is much more suited to men of scientific bent of mind than those in england consequently the influence of tutors has been testified to far more abundantly by those men on my list who have been educated in scotland than by the rest the proportions are striking and instructive i find that about one-sixth of those from whom i have received returns have studied in scotland hence if professional influences had been equally efficacious on both sides of the tweed there would have been five times as many expressions of gratitude to english teachers as to scotch but the facts show that no less than eight out of the thirteen cases refer to teachers in scotland one to a scotch teacher settled in england and only four to english professors it would have been eight multiplied by five equals forty and not four if the english education had been as profitable to science as the scotch i willingly admit that the smallness of the numbers namely only thirteen cases renders precise figures open to question however the superiority of the scotch system is supported by other evidence which i shall speak of in the chapter on education physics and mathematics seven i believe the origin was when i attended the natural philosophy classes at blank ten tastes confirmed by lectures and especially by the encouragement of certain professors twenty interest in mathematics due to the encouragement of blank and influence of professors at a university chemistry seven chiefly to being sent as a pupil to an eminent man of science geology five lectures by blank zoology five my scientific tastes were largely promoted by the attractive teaching of blank various professors seventeen and to being the assistant and close companion of blank twenty four i can trace it in part distinctly to my intercourse with certain professors botany four i date my first efforts of any consequence from an early intimacy with blank whose pupil and assistant i was the necessity of accurate work then dawned upon me six the companionship of blank incited me to prosecute botany with vigour i was one of his best pupils and travelled with him medical science four subsequently by the approval of teachers having been selected chief assistant statistics four very clear occasional lectures when a boy on moral and economical subjects the tastes were afterwards developed by a good education six professor blank's lectures were the origin of my interest in geology it was the earliest scientific pursuit of this correspondent mechanical science none h travel in distant parts there are only eight cases in this group namely those in which the aspects of nature under new conditions have developed a love for science few men of scientific training have had opportunities of distant travel but on those few their actions have been very strong especially as regards biologists and physicists i say nothing here in respect to mere geographers and quote none of their replies because its importance to them requires neither proof nor comment men are too apt to accept as an axiomatic law not capable of further explanation whatever they see recurring day after day without fail so the dog in the back yard looks on the daily arrival of the postman butcher and baker as so many elementary phenomena not to be barked at or wandered about travel in distant countries by unsettling those quasi axiomatic ideas restores to the educated man the freshness of childhood in observing new things and in seeking reasons for all he sees i believe that a handsome endowment of travelling fellowships thoroughly well paid with extra allowance for any special work allotted to their holders given only to young men of high qualifications and lasting for at least five years would be money well bestowed in the furtherance of science physics and mathematics three to some extent my tastes were determined by events after manhood because for ten years i held positions of great responsibility in distant parts of the world but i considered they were formed in my youth nine ocean voyaging in the beginning of life solitary observing for years in a country verging on a desert under southern skies thirteen the distinct origin blank 
was the wonderful effect on me by the aspects of nature as seen in the blank combined with what i may call the accident of having been allowed to explore part of it in an official capacity fourteen largely determined by my service in north polar and equatorial expeditions chemistry none geology seven subsequently much influenced by being thrown at estimate nineteen on my own judgment and resources in founding a mining colony in the backwoods of blank and carrying it out quite alone zoology two strongly confirmed and erected by the voyage in the blank thirteen my appointment to the surveying ship blank made me a comparative anatomist by affording opportunities for the investigation of the structure of the lower animals botany five they were directed to botany purely through accidental circumstances which led to a prolonged residence in an imperfectly civilized country z unclass residuum we now come to the final group namely those influences which cannot be sorted into any of the eight groups with definite titles which we have already examined at the outset i spoke of these unclassed conditions as forming a class by themselves of no great importance and which might be indefinitely reduced in proportion as we chose to pursue our analysis i estimate that the ninety one replies which i have received and analyzed assigned a total of one hundred ninety one causes it now appears that no less than 188 of these fall into one or other of eight definite groups, and that there remain only three on our hands for the unclassed residuum. Even these are apparently due to aggregates of conditions, the more important of which would probably find their place among the eight groups, leaving a still minuter residue. We may lightly dismiss them as of inappreciably small importance in our present inquiry. Chemistry 10 entirely due to circumstance after manhood and in direct opposition to family influences eleven to opportunity at a foreign university geology eight the taste developed gradually after manhood summary if we take a general survey of our national stock of capabilities and their produce we see that the large part is directed to gain daily bread and necessary luxuries and to keep the great social machine in steady work the surplus is considerable and may be disposed of in various ways let us now put ourselves in the position of advocates of science solely and consider from that point of view how out of the surplus capabilities of the nation might be diverted to its furtherance how can the tastes of men be most powerfully acted upon to affect them towards science the large category a of innate tastes is practically beyond our immediate influence but though we cannot increase the national store we need not waste it as we do now every instance in which a man having an aptitude to succeed in science is tempted by circumstances which might be controlled to occupy himself with subjects of less national value is a public calamity aptitudes and tastes for occupations which enrich the thoughts and productive powers of man are as much articles of national wealth as coal and iron and their waste is as reprehensible educational monopolies which offer numerous and great prizes for work of other descriptions have caused enormous waste of scientific ability by inducing those who might have succeeded in science to spend their energies with small effect on uncongenial occupations when a pursuit is instinctive and the will is untaxed an immense amount of work may be accomplished with ease witness to take an extreme case the sustained action of the wholly involuntary muscles the heart does its work unceasingly from birth to death and it is no light work but such as the arm working a pump handle would soon weary of maintaining or again think of the migratory flight of birds in obedience to an instinct or of the muscular force astonishing both in magnitude and endurance exhibited by lunatics who have some real though morbid passion which goes them to exercise it we must therefore learn to respect innate tastes which directly as in a or indirectly as in c serve the cause of science as regards b the fortunate accidents weaken multiply opportunities there is great hope in respect to d the professional influences it is clear to all who have knowledge of the scope of modern science that there exists an immense deal of national work which has to be performed and which none but men of scientific cultures are qualified to undertake scientific superintendence is required for all kinds of technical education for statistical investigations of innumerable kinds and deductions from them for sanitary administration in the broadest sense for agriculture mining industrial occupations war engineering 
there is everywhere a demand for scientific assessors who shall discover how to economize effort and find out new processes and fruitful principles professional duties generally ought to be more closely bound up with strictly scientific work than they are at present and this requirement would tend to foster scientific tastes in minds which had little inborn tendency that way in respect to g the influence and encouragement of tutors seeing how far scotland had surpassed england in the attractiveness of her mode of teaching which is by professional lectures rather than by class work it is clear that the english system admits of being greatly improved and the influence of her teachers proportionally increased in turning the minds of youth to science lastly as regards h travel in distant lands its indirect value deserves far more than the moderate sums assigned to its prosecution in the way of star travelling fellowships and rare voyages of surveying ships to sum up in a few words it seems to me that the interpretation to be put on the replies we have now been considering is that a love of science might be largely extended by fostering and not thwarting innate tendencies by the extension of scientific professional appointments and professorships by assimilating in some cases the english system of teaching to that of the scotch and by creating travelling and other fellowships which shall enable their holders to view nature in various aspects and to work with foreigners whose habits of thought are fruitful in themselves but of a different kind to our own i will take this opportunity of drawing attention to what appears to me one of the greatest desiderata of this kind in the present day namely the establishment of medical fellowships amply sufficient to enable the best youths who intend to follow medicine as a profession to spend their early manhood in prosecuting independent medical researches i appeal to capitalists who know not what use free from abuse to make of their surplus wealth to consider this want they might greatly improve the practical skill of the english medical profession by affording opportunities of prolonged study they might perhaps themselves reap some part of the benefit of it a young medical man has now to waste the most vigorous years of his life in miserable routine work simply to obtain bread until he has been able to establish his reputation he has no breathing time allowed him the cares of mature life press too closely upon his student days to give him the opportunities of prolonged study that are necessary to accomplish him for his future profession the influences we have been considering are those which urge men to pursue science rather than literature politics or other careers but we must not forget that there are deep and obscure movements of national life which may quicken or depress the effective ability of the nation as a whole i have not considered the reasons why one period is more productive of great men than another my inquiry being limited for the reasons stated in the first pages of this book to one period and nation but it may be remarked that the national condition most favourable to general efficiency is one of self-confidence and eager belief in the existence of great works capable of accomplishment the opposite attitude is indifferentism founded on sheer uncertainty of what is best to do or on despair of being strong enough to achieve useful results a feeling such as that which has generally existed in recent years among wealthy men in respect to pauperism and charitable gifts a common effect of indifferentism is to dissipate the energy of the nation upon trifles and this tendency seems to be a crying evil of the present day in our own country in illustration of this view i will quote the following extract from a letter of one of my correspondents who i should add is singularly well qualified to form a just opinion on the matter to which he is so forcibly calls attention the principal hindrance to inquiry and all other intellectual progress in the people of whom i see much is the elaborate machinery for wasting time which has been invented and recommended under the name of social duties considering the mental and material capital of which the richer classes have the disposal i believe that much more than half the progressive force of the nation runs to waste from this cause a great deal of energy is wasted in attempting to seize more than can be grasped there is a feverish tendency fostered by the daily press to interest oneself in all that goes on which leads to perpetual destruction and curtails the time available for serious and sustained effort it may be worth while to mention a curious little morbid experience of my own as suggestive of much more mischief it is this a few years ago i had foolishly overworked myself as many others have done misled by a perverted instinct which goaded to increased exertion instead of dictating rest the consequence was that i fairly broke down and could not for some days even look at a book or any sort of writing i went abroad and though i grew much better and could amuse myself with books the first town where i experienced real repose was rome there was no doubt of the influence of the place it was strongly marked and for a long time i sought in vain for the reason of it 
at last what i accepted as a full and adequate explanation occurred to me simply that there were no advertisements on the walls there was a picturesqueness and grandeur in the streets which sufficed to fill the mind and there were no petty distractions to fret a weak dying brain when we are in health we take little count of the racket of english life which may keep a pathetic minds from stagnation but which causes needless wear and tear to active ones suggesting nothing useful and teasing distracting and wearying i have heard german professors speak with wonder at our waste of energy in mere fidget and in so-called amusements which are mostly very dull and ascribe the successful laboriousness of their own countrymen to the greater simplicity of the lives they lead and they are a happier people than we are partial failures we have seen that energy health steady pursuit of purpose business habits independence of views and a strong innate taste for science are generally combined in the character of a successful scientific man probably one half of the men on my list possess every one of these qualities in a considerable and some in a high degree if one or more of these qualities be deficient success becomes impossible lest its absence be appropriately supplemented by other qualities or conditions causes may be specified in which too few of the above mentioned qualities were present and which consequently ended in an abortive career one is the possession of energy health and independence of character in excess and little else to control them these are dangerous gifts those who have them are apt to renounce guidances by which the great body of mankind move safely and to follow out a career in which they are almost certain to blunder and fail egregiously probably every large emigrant ship takes out many such men full of unjustifiable self-confidence who to use a current phrase knock about in the world waste their health use and opportunities and end broken down another case is that in which a strong innate taste for science is accompanied by independence of character and steadiness of pursuit but with no other quality helpful to success in which therefore leads to no useful result there is hardly a village where some ingenious man may not be found who has ideas and much shrewdness but is crotchety and impractical he wants energy and business habits so he never rises many of these men brood over subjects like perpetual motion their peculiarities are well illustrated in de morgan's book of paradoxes again we frequently meet persons of a stamp that justifies the old-fashioned caricature of scientific men who are absorbed in some petty investigation utterly deficient in business habits and noted for absence of mind even idiots have often strongly quasi scientific tastes as love for simple mechanisms or objects in natural history and they have as already remarked a pleasure in collecting madmen have often persistency as is shown by their brooding on a single topic we all of us must have met with curious cases of failures where a mind and disposition that promises much for success never achieves it it may be that some mental screw is loose or there is some irreparable weakness of judgment or some untimely irresolution or rashness any fault of this kind is sufficient to mar a man's chances when competition is keen to obtain the highest order of success two things are wanted first the qualities of the man must either be good or round or else he must be so circumstanced as to be able when the need arises to supplement his deficiencies by extraneous help secondly he must have some very useful qualities highly developed it is said that genius is required for high success and there is much talk about what genius is and on the failures of men of genius while some persons go so far as to doubt the existence of genius as a separate quality it appears to me that what is generally meant by genius when the world is used in a special sense is the automatic activity of the mind as distinguished from the effort of the will in a man of genius the ideas come as by inspiration in other words his character is enthusiastic his mental associations are rapid numerous and firm his imagination is vivid and he is driven rather than drives himself all men have some genius they are all apt under excitement to show flashes of unusual enthusiasm and to experience swift and strange associations of ideas in dreams all men commonly exhibit more vivid powers of imagination than are possessed by the greatest artists when awake sober plodding will is quite another quality and its over-exercise exhausts the more sprightly functions of the mind as is expressed in the proverb too much work makes a dull boy but no man is likely to achieve very high success in whom the automatic power of the mind or genius in its special sense and a sober will are not well developed and fairly balanced End of chapter 3, part 2 of English Men of Science by Francis Galton.
Chapter 4 of English Men of Science by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Leon Harvey. Chapter 4 Education. Preliminary Education, pray throughout or nearly so. Merits in education. Merits and demerits balanced. Demerits. Summary. Conclusion. I now pass on to the education which the scientific men had in their youth, in the hope that my results may give assistance to those who are endeavouring to frame systems of education suitable to the wants of the day. What I have to say is very partial. It refers solely to the opinions the scientific men entertain of the merits and faults of their own several educations in bygone days. Their views are remarkably unanimous, considering the very different branches of inquiry they are interested in and the great dissimilarities in their education. One third of those who sent replies have been educated at Oxford or Cambridge, one third at Scotch, Irish or London universities, and the remaining third at no university at all. I am totally unable to decide which of the three groups occupies a higher scientific position. They seem to me very much alike in this respect. The questions to which the following replies were given were as follows. Was your education especially conductive to or restrictive of habits of observation? Was your education eminently conductive to health or the reverse? What do you consider to have been peculiar merits in your education? What were the chief omissions in it, and what faults of commission can you indicate? I also asked for information concerning the places of education, both schools and colleges, and as regards home and self-instruction. The answers were, in some cases, very interesting from their minute elaboration, but I am of course restricted on this occasion to a simple treatment of them. I cannot now paint with delicate tints, but must content myself with broad lights and shades. The following answers are extracts, and in some few cases abstracts. They convey the general tone of the several replies as nearly as possible. The groups under which I have sorted them are these. Merits. Education praised throughout, or nearly so, 10 replies. Variety of subjects, 10 replies. A little science at school, 3 replies. Simple things well taught, three replies. Liberty and leisure, three replies. Home teaching and encouragement, eight replies. Merits and demerits balanced, four replies. Demerits. Narrow education, 32 replies. Want of system and bad teaching, 10 replies. Unclassed, four replies. Total, 87. There are a few cases in which an answer already given in combination has been extracted and repeated merits education praised throughout or nearly so ten cases one was admirably taught estimating thirteen to sixteen and a half to reason use my own mind or myself was taught to acquire large masses of information by reading there was a little tendency to a vagrant style of reading but this was probably neutralized by other influences two well taught in classics and mathematics. If possible, my education should have afforded facilities for the study of the science of observation, but I doubt the practicality of this at school. While a schoolboy, I taught myself botany, chemistry, etc., under great disadvantages. 3. Careful and good early education at home by my mother and father, then rather strict training by my father and by my first schoolmaster, being carefully looked after by my father and expected to do my best. 4. My education was well balanced. It was general and of a very complete kind, including chemistry, botany, logic, and political economy. By three years, estimating 12 to 15, spent in learning the Latin and Greek grammars were a blank waste of time. 5. Education including French, German, logic, natural philosophy, chemistry, besides mathematics. I lived in a house where I saw many people whose interests were of various kinds, and I went to a day school where I mixed with the boys only when they were fresh and active. Thus I had two outer worlds to balance against each other. On the whole I had, I think, the greatest degree of freedom possible to a boy. 6. Was at school till estimated 16, and with a tutor in Germany for six months, after then technical training and teaching. The education was conductive both to observation and health. Variety of subjects and attention to details a combination of home and school education, my father having been headmaster of the school. 7. My father being a schoolmaster, I was at 
some sort of schoolwork nearly all my life but from the age of twelve i was occupied more in teaching than in learning my education included the various subjects usually taught in english schools with something of astronomy pneumatics electricity and mechanics i learnt much in conversation with my father which chiefly took an instructive form which led to think and speak freely also engaged frequently in domestic discussions on questions of general policy i had also early access to tools and materials eight i was fortunate in obtaining at school estimate eight to sixteen an insight into the phenomena of nature a subject entirely ignored at that time in almost all schools my peculiar bent for experiment was encouraged at home by my mother and there were peculiar merits in my training under professors blank and blank and especially in germany under blank nine the steadiness with which i was taught by one eccentric schoolmaster reading and accurate spelling clear neat and intelligible writing and quick and accurate computation by all the primary rules of arithmetic faults in these several branches were never overlooked and all competition was for excellence in each latin and french were evidently thrown into pleased parents going to sea at the age of thirteen i really think i started with the best education i could have had compared with my youthful messmates some of whom had passed through public schools i was far their superior in writing i soon acquired chart drawing and sketching from nature and in calculation of the day's work and in astronomical observations merits in education variety of subjects nine replies one not tied down to old courses of classics and mathematics two my master estimate fifteen to seventeen was a man of scientific and generally liberal turn of mind three sufficient groundwork in many subjects to avoid error four early introduced to many subjects of interest five a well-balanced education including chemistry botany logic and political economy six a variety of subjects and attention to details coming in contact with persons of every rank in scotland and sitting on the same form with the sons of tradesmen and ploughmen as well as of gentlemen seven and eight two cases both being englishmen praise scotch system of education nine living in a house where there were many interests and going thence to a day school where there were other and different ones merits in education a little science at school three replies one only one good thing that was object lessons though given badly and only for a short time two all the merits of my schooling i attribute to a little elementary physics and chemistry taught me between the ages of seven and thirteen three science taught me at school between the ages of eleven and sixteen merits in education simple things well taught three replies one clear neat and intelligible writing accurate spelling and simple computation two was very well grounded in arithmetic at school three forced accuracy of delineation at home estimate fourteen to sixteen merits in education liberty and leisure three replies one unusual degree of freedom two freedom to follow my own inclinations and choose my own subjects of study or the reverse three the great proportion of time left free to do as i liked unwatched and uncontrolled merits in education home teaching and home encouragement eight replies one encouragement by my mother two encouragement by my father three carefully looked after by my father and expected to do my best four c seven in education praise throughout or nearly so five during one year estimate seventeen i recited and studied with my uncle by marriage and learnt there more of the dead languages than in all my school time six my private education at home was much the more valuable seven home and self-education developed my observing faculties eight pretty much self-taught but encouraged to use my eyes wits and independent thought merits and demerits in education balanced four replies one left to myself i pursued a discursive line as compared with ordinary schools i think self-teaching has many advantages for boys of active mind but intelligent teaching and insisting on accuracy and completeness would have produced a much more efficient man two the merits of my education consisted in a great number of studies connected with nature but there was a want of system and of consecutive study three the demerit of my education was a want of being thoroughly grounded this gave me great trouble but made me think for myself often an advantage to me four 
No sound instruction. The education was too general and desultory, but it gave wide interest. Demerits. Narrow education. 32 cases. 1. No mathematics nor modern languages, nor any habits of observation or reasoning. 2. Enormous time devoted to Latin and Greek, with which languages I am not conversant. 3. Omission of almost everything useful and good, except being taught to read. Latin, Latin, Latin. 4. Latin through Latin. Nonsense verses. 5. Limitation of subjects practically to classics. Absence of any scientific training, too much confined to classics. 7. Omission of mathematics, German and drawing. 8. Latin and Greek were more insisted on than modern languages. 9. In an otherwise well-balanced education, three years, estimated 12-15, at a private school were spent on Latin and Greek grammar, a blank waste of time. 10. Schoolwork directed to the cultivation of literary tastes only, and, therefore, not adapted to a variety of intellects. 11. Elements of natural science omitted. Nothing taught of the nature of the world around us. 12. Not taught mathematics, nor any natural science, to which I could have taken con amore. 13. Absence of instruction in the modern languages. 14. Want of the modern languages and of chemistry. 15. Want of logical and mathematical training. 16. Want of training in the habits of observation. 17. Neglect of mathematics, too much reliance on mere work of memory. Mental training overlooked in the mere acquisition of routine. 18. I could now wish that I had gone through at the university a good course of chemistry and physics as a preparation for the other branches, but the main obstacle was lack of time. 19. Want of education of faculties of observation, want of mathematics and of modern languages. 20. Not allowing my mind to follow its natural bias. 21. Neglect of many subjects for the attainment of one or two, not pushing mathematics to a useful end. 22. Not enough liberty put back by too much grounding at Cambridge. 23. At school, the classical education, viz. construing, parsing, and learning grammatical rules, was not to my taste. At Oxford, I wasted much time, having little sympathy with the university pursuits and habits. 24. Having so exclusively devoted myself to mathematics at Cambridge. 25. The classical teaching was said to be good, but I did not assimilate it. Perhaps my mental peculiarities and my special ineptitude to commit words to memory would have rendered most education, such as it was when I was a boy, ineffectual for much good. The main defect for me, certainly, was that precise verbal memory was the test of all knowledge. No doubt, in some things, such as languages, precise knowledge of words is essential, and therefore I refer to my own special defect in saying this. 26. My schoolwork was too predominantly classical, and nearly everything was taught on authority. 27. Persistence in giving me no holiday and overstraining my memory when I was very young. 28. My principal regret is that I was unable to pursue the study of mathematics. 29. Mathematics were not pushed far enough. Natural science was left to the boys themselves. 30. My boyhood was utterly wasted and the efforts of my manhood have not sufficed and never will suffice to repair the loss. 31. A mission of all subjects excepting the classics, but particularly faulty in the want of intellectual training. 32. A military man. The authority of a military education is prejudicial to the development of thought and education in matters of opinion. Demerits in education. Want of system and bad teaching. 10 cases. 1. Want of system. 2. Want of system. 3. Want of system. 4. Want of system, absence of necessary control. 5. Bad early masters, neglect at public school. 6. Essentially defective, no competition or supervision. 7. The very mistaken way in which languages, as it now seems to me, especially Latin and Greek, were taught. 8. Too much for memory, nothing for thought. 9. Want of thoroughness in early teaching. 10. Careless and superficial reading. Demerits in education, unclassed, four cases. 1. Brought up in an idle class and never realised the necessity of labour in acquirement. 2. Too much cramming for examinations, too much isolated being the youngest son and educated at home. 3. Two great changes in system, having been educated at five universities, 
three of which were Scotch, one London, and one in Germany. 4. Being brought up at home, was perhaps too much shut out from the company of other boys. Summary The scientific men on my list have very generally ascribed high merits to a varied education. They say, as we have just seen, not tied down to old courses of classics and mathematics, sufficient groundwork in many subjects to avoid error, a well-balanced education including chemistry, botany, logic, and political economy. Coming in contact with persons of every rank and sitting in the same form in a Scotch school, with the sons of tradesmen and ploughmen, as well as gentlemen. In contrast to this, others who speak of the faults of their education say, No mathematics, nor modern languages, nor any habits of observation or reasoning, enormous time devoted to Latin and Greek, with which languages I am not conversant. In an otherwise well-balanced education, three years were spent on Latin and Greek grammar, a blank waste of time. Neglect of many subjects for the attainment of one or two, not pushing mathematics to a useful end. Evidence such as this fully establishes the advantage of a variety of study. One group of men speak gratefully because they had it, and another speak regretfully because they had it not. I find none who had a reasonable variety who disapproved of it, none who had a purely old-fashioned education who were satisfied with it. The scientific men who came from the large public schools usually did nothing when there, they could not assimilate the subjects taught, and have abused the old system heartily. There are several serious complaints about superficial and bad teaching which I need not quote afresh. Overteaching is thoroughly objected to, thus in speaking of merits of education, I find freedom to follow my own inclinations and to choose my own subjects of study, or the reverse. The great proportion of time left free to do as I liked, unwatched and uncontrolled. Unusual degree of freedom. There is much scattered evidence throughout the replies to my questions generally, in addition to what I have extracted, which implies that this feeling is a very common one. There are many touching evidences of the strong effect of home encouragement and teaching. Of this I have already spoken, and need not dwell upon afresh. In corroboration of the conclusions stated in page 216 on the favourable influences of the Scotch system in developing a taste for science, I remark that in these replies a large proportion of the scientific men who have mentioned any merits in their education were educated in Scotland. As regards the subjects specially asked for, even by biologists, mathematics takes a prominent place. Two of my correspondents speak strongly of the advantages derived from logic and the weighty judgment of the late John S. Mill powerfully corroborates their opinions. Accuracy of delineation is also spoken of and owing to the extraordinary prevalence of mechanical aptitudes I believe that the teaching of mechanical drawing and manipulation would be greatly prized. The interpretation that I put on the answers as a whole is as follows. To teach a few congenial and useful things very thoroughly, to encourage curiosity concerning as wide a range of subjects as possible, and not to overteach. As regards the precise subjects for rigorous instruction, the following seem to me in strict accordance with what would have best pleased those of the scientific men who have sent me returns. 1. Mathematics pushed as far as the capacity of the learner admits, and its processes utilised as far as possible for interesting ends and practical application. 2. Logic, on the grounds already stated, but on those only. 3. Observation, theory and experiment. In at least one branch of science, some boys taking one branch and some another, to ensure a variety of interests in the school. 4. Accurate drawing of objects connected with a branch of science pursued. 5. Mechanical manipulation, for the reasons already given, and also because mechanical skill is occasionally of great use to nearly all scientific men in their investigations. These five subjects should be rigorously taught. They are anything but an excessive program, and there would remain plenty of time for that variety of work which is so highly prized as ready access to books, much reading of interesting literature, history and poetry, languages learnt, probably best during the vacations, in the easiest and swiftest manner, with the sole object of enabling the learners to read ordinary books in them. This seems sufficient, because my returns show that men of science are not made by much teaching, but rather by awakening their interests, encouraging their pursuits when at home, and leaving them to teach themselves continuously throughout life. Much teaching fills a youth with knowledge, but tends prematurely to satiate his appetite for more. I am surprised at the mediocre degrees which the leading scientific men who were at the universities have usually taken, always excepting the mathematicians. Being original, they are naturally less receptive 
they prefer to fix of their own accord on certain subjects and seem adverse to learn what is put before them as a task their independence of spirit and coldness of disposition are not conductive to success in competition they doggedly go their own way and refuse to run races conclusion science has hitherto been at a disadvantage compared with other competing pursuits in enlisting the intention of the best intellects of the nation for reasons that are partially inherent and partially artificial to these i will briefly refer in conclusion with a special reference to the very important question as to how far the progress of events tends to counterbalance or remove them if we class energy intellect and the like under the general name of ability it follows that under circumstances being the same those able men who have vigour to spare for extra professional pursuits will be mainly governed in their choice of them by the instinctive tastes of their manhood the majority will address themselves to topics nearly connected with human interests a few will turn to science this tendency to abandon the colder attractions of science for those of political and social life must always be powerfully reinforced by the very general inclination of women to exert their influence in the latter direction again those who select some branch of science as a profession must do so in spite of the fact that it is more unremunerative than any other pursuit a great and salutary change has undoubtedly come over the feeling of the nation since the time when the present leading men of science were boys for education was at that time conducted in the interests of the clergy and was strongly opposed to science it crushed the inquiring spirit the love of observation the pursuit of inductive studies the habit of independent thought and it protected classics and mathematics by giving them the monopoly of all prizes for intellectual work such as scholarships fellowships church livings canonaries bishoprics and the rest this gigantic monopoly is yielding but obstinately and slowly and it is unlikely that the friends of science will be able for many years to come to relax their efforts in educational reform as regards the future provision for successful followers of science it is to be hoped that in addition to the many new openings in industrial pursuits the gradual but sure development of sanitary administration and statistical inquiry may in time afford the needed profession these and adequately paid professorships may as i sincerely hope they will even in our days give rise to the establishment of a sort of scientific priesthood throughout the kingdom whose high duties will have reference to the health and well-being of the nation in its broadest sense and whose emoluments and social position would be made commensurate with the importance and variety of their functions end of chapter four of english men of science Appendix to the English Men of Science by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Leon Harvey. Appendix My schedule of printed questions, together with the ample spaces left for replies, filled, I am half ashamed to acknowledge, seven huge quarto pages. It would be a cumbrous addition to a publication like the present to reproduce these in the same form in which they were framed, and as the following extracts, with trifling variations rendered necessary by the change of form, cover precisely the same ground, and are sufficient for explanation, I abstain from doing so. A circular letter, in which I explained briefly the object of the inquiry accompanied the schedule, and I appended to it a reprint of a short article which i had written in the fortnightly review early in eighteen seventy three partially to show the interest which i had pursued coordinated queries and partially as a guarantee of the tone and spirit in which the inserted communications would be treated also i presumed and as it has proved not without reason that being more or less personally acquainted with a large majority of the scientific men on my list they would be inclined to put greater faith in my discretion than if i had been a stranger subject to these preparatory explanations the following are the questions that i had circulated inquiry into the attendance of scientific men please return this schedule at your earliest convenience with answers to as many of the questions as you consider to be unobjectionable and send on a separate paper any further information that you may think germane to the inquiry entries marked private will be dealt with in strict confidence they will be used only as data for general statistical conclusions note whenever you consider the grade of the quality about which a question is asked to fall near mediocrity do not make any entry at all christian names of yourself 
your father and your mother, also her maiden name. Designation and principal titles of yourself, your father, and the father of your mother. Your father and mother, are they respectively English, Welsh, Scotch, Irish, Jewish, or foreign? If foreign, of what country? Holy, or in what degree? Was either your father or your mother descended from persons persecuted for political or religious opinions, or from political or religious refugees? If so, state the precise relationship. Mention whether their political or religious opinions became traditional in the family. Occupation of yourself, your father, and the father of your mother. Specify any interests that have been very actively pursued by them, in addition to their regular occupation or profession. All the questions in the following paragraph are asked concerning yourself, your father, and your mother, respectively. Date of birth, place of birth. If you do not remember that of either your father or mother, state whether he or she resided in early life. Mention if it was in a large or small town, a suburb, a village, or a house in the country. To what religious bodies have you, self, father, and mother, respectively belonged? To what political parties? Health at the various periods of life. In early adult life, what was your height to be estimated, where not accurately remembered? Was there anything distinctive in the figure, etc.? Spare, symmetrical, muscular, etc. Colour of hair. Complexion, if remarkably fair, dark, ruddy, pale, sallow, etc. Temperament, if distinctly nervous, sanguine, bilious, or lymphatic. Measurement round the inside of rim of your hat. Energy of body, if remarkable, as shown by power of activity, power of enduring fatigue, restlessness, requiring but little sleep, state how much. Early rising, adventures, travel, mountaineering, etc. Give a few facts. Energy of mind, if remarkable, is shown by power of accomplishing a large amount of brain work, by the vigorous pursuit of interests, whatever they may be, etc. Give a few facts. Retentiveness of memory, give facts. Studiousness of disposition and mental receptivity, as shown by large acquirements. Independence of judgment in social, political or religious matters, give illustrations. Originality or eccentricity of character. Give illustrations. Special talents. As for mechanism, practical business habits, music, mathematics, etc. Strongly marked mental peculiarities, bearing on scientific success and not specified above. The following list may serve to suggest impulsiveness, steadiness, strong feelings and partisanship, social affections, religious bias of thought, love of the new and marvellous, curiosity about facts, love of pursuit, constructiveness of imagination, foresight, public spirit, disinterestedness. Are any peculiarities either very uniformly developed or also very irregularly developed among yourself, your brothers and sisters, or in the family of your father, or in that of your mother? State the number of males and that of the females in each of the following degrees of relationship who have attained 30 years of age or thereabouts. Grandparents, both sides, parents, uncles and aunts, both sides, Brothers and sisters, first cousins of all four descriptions, nephews and nieces. In each of these several degrees of relationship, state the names of those who have occupied prominent positions or written well-known works, or who, from any other cause, may be considered as public characters. State their principal achievements, mention the best biographies, and the most useful among the scattered biographical notes that may exist of them, terms of award of medals, etc., also, in each of the above degrees of relationship, give the number, with initials or name, of those whose ability in any respect was considerable, but who did not become public characters. Further information will be sent on a separate paper. Similar information is acceptable concerning other more remote degrees of relationship. Brief notes concerning hereditary peculiarities of any kind or family, bodily or mental, would be acceptable. How many brothers and sisters had you older than yourself and how many younger how long were you at small schools large schools universities and at what age name or place of school or university and chief subjects taught there mention any honours of importance gained by you at schools or universities to what extent were you educated elsewhere taught at home or self-taught was your education especially conductive to or restrictive of habits of observation was it eminently conductive to health or the reverse what do you consider to have been peculiar merits in it? What were the chief omissions in it, and what faults of commission can you indicate? 
Has the religion taught in your youth had any deterrent effect on the freedom of your researches? Can you trace the origin of your interest in science in general and in your particular branch of it? How far do your scientific tastes appear to have been innate? Were they largely determined by events occurring after you reached manhood, and by what events? Have you been married? Years in which you were married, made a name of your wife, number of living sons and daughters of all ages, state any facts of peculiar interest in your wife's family. End of Appendix of the English Men of Science End of the English Men of Science by Francis Galton in Season 2 of Missing Pages, we'll take a look at what happens when an old system faces new challenges. This is what happens when you involve money. I'm Beth Ann Patrick, your host of Season 2 of the Missing Pages podcast. We'll dig into these stories and talk to authors like Jody Picot for their firsthand experiences. You can childproof your world, but you can't worldproof your child. Listen and subscribe to Season 2 of Missing Pages wherever you get your podcasts.